So this is the um, second day of the workshop about the calcium modeling and uh, uh, visualization. And it's great that we had the first day have lots of wonderful talks. And uh, um, so this workshop is organized by uh, Marizo, Mar Marizo, Marie, Marizo, Marizo, and Ivo and me. So basically, they are. They, this they time, are, this uh, time it was they, a little bit closer. Doing lots yes. of works can than me because it's uh, uh, six six p.m. in Melbourne, so it's not good time. So they've done a lot of work in the organization of the, this workshop. And uh, um, I'm going to chair this session and also with Evo. So Evo will introduce two speakers and I will introduce uh, two speakers. So I, I'm going to introduce the first speaker, uh, James Sneed. Um, is that OK? I, I kick you out, uh, Maurizio. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. <laughs> OK, I will invite James. And there I am. Hi, James. Hey, Peng Zheng, and hello, everybody else as well. OK, I, I need to give you a brief uh, uh, introduction uh, to the audience. Knock yourself out. <laughs> um, that's a very official way to introduce James. Um, and it's my pleasure to actually introduce James uh, at such a big conference and because I haven't got any chance to do this. So James Need is a must, like, masterful on um, mathematical biology because he's not a mathematician, he said. He's a mathematical biologist working on modern calcium dynamics for around uh, 30 years and has shown a strong leadership in calcium modeling area. And his work is featured by many, many scientific papers and uh, an awarding winning book, Mathematical Physiology, uh, written together with James Keener. Uh, James got his PhD from New York University, supervised by Dan Trenchani, uh, uh, Trenchani, uh, Trenchina and uh, Char uh, Charlie um, Peskin. And then spent one year as a postdoc working with his uh, dream mentor, uh, Jim Murray, in Oxford, because I didn't get a PhD with him. <laughs> and James then uh, worked at the University of Canberra uh, in New Zealand and uh, uh, went, to, went to the US again, uh, University of uh, Michigan, and uh, came back to uh, New Zealand again, uh, working uh, at Massey University, and then eventually joined the University of Auckland as a professor. And so that's pretty much that. And uh, also, he he had a PhD students, which is Peng Xing, which is me. <laughs> and and uh, okay, I hand over to James, talking about calcium in cellular um, secretion modeling. Okay, thanks very much, Peng Zheng. I can tell you are very well trained indeed. So I guess I just share my screen and get my slides up now, huh? Yes. Okay. Let me do that. And yep. can you see my screen? Yes, yes, perfect. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, let me get into it. I'm going to be talking about calcium in salivary glands. Uh, I know that many of you people here know, uh, know an awful lot about calcium, so I'll skip over much of the stuff at the beginning to get to the more interesting new experiments at the end. Quite a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today has in fact not been published yet, but we are hoping to get it out soon. I should also say that all the experiments you see today were done by David Yule and his lab at the University of Rochester. And uh, most of the computations you see today were done by John Rugus at the University of Auckland. Although Sean Means, who is going to be speaking right after me, played a major role in some of our earlier computational efforts too. So Sean, thank you very much. All right. What is a parotid gland? It's, these, are, these are the glands which make 
which make uh, uh, saliva. And here's a typical picture. And uh, I hope you can all see my mouse moving on the screen here. And the uh, gland is made up of, of a bunch of acinar cells, which are the cells that actually transport the water. They are connected uh, to a, a line of duct cells, which then transport the saliva uh, through the ducts into the mouth. Uh, how does saliva secretion work sort of in general? Well, it kind of works like this. Each of the salivary cells, each of the acinar cells, is is uh, very is polarized. It's a polarized ep epithelial cell. In the luminal side of the cell, which is called the apical side, you get uh, calcium activated chloride channels. And in the basolateral side, which faces into the interstitium or the blood, you get the other machinery, in particular the sodium potassium ATPase and the sodium potassium chloride co-transporter. When, uh, for example, you're stimulated by you know, smell or sight or taste, then that results in the release of transmitter, often acetylcholine, and that starts off a process within these cells whereby you get the release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm of these cells in a process I'll be talking a lot more about soon. And this calcium activates this chloride channel here it activates this potassium channel here. This results in a gradient of chloride concentration from the interstitium to the cell into the lumen. And that osmotic gradient uh, leads to water flow down that osmotic gradient. So it's water transport by straight osmosis. It's not like Navier-Stokes or anything like that. Now, as you saw on this slide here, Calcium is the is the immediate indicator of is is the is the prox is the proximal cause of this um, chloride gradient uh, giving us fluid flow, and if we look at what calcium does in these cells, here's some fairly old data from a it'll be a, a mouse parotid cell, and if we watch a movie, we can see high cytosolic calcium concentrations denoted by the you know the the lighter colours, the greens and the and the reds and things. And this is a, an example of multiple cells. So in this field, there are multiple cells. Inside each cell, the calcium concentration has this very distinctive pattern. You get this oscillatory pattern. And the frequency of the oscillation appears to depend upon the concentration of the agonist. In this case, it's carbocol, very similar to acetylcholine. Here's on the left here is just a, a, a picture of the number of cells. So there's probably 20 or 30 cells in that picture. So it's not a very high-res picture. Uh, the point being, of course, that the calcium forms a wave across the cell. So if you take a group of three cells here, here's the cell and here's the lumen in the middle of the cell. And if you stimulate the cell at this red dot, you will see when you play the movie, the calcium first responds here very briefly, but then the major calcium response starts in the opposite end of the cell in the apical region so you stimulate in the basal region the calcium wave starts in the apical region and then propagates backwards across the cell until it reaches the basal region that was a uh, something which we saw time and time again in isolated cells and isolated glands so how do how how do we model all this stuff? I'm assuming I, you're all convinced that we should, but how do we do it? And again, I imagine that many people here will know uh, an awful lot about calcium. So I'll just go over this fairly quickly. Basically, the cytoplasm of the calcium, uh, the cytoplasm of the cell is kept at a very low calcium concentration. Outside the cell is a very high calcium concentration. Inside the endoplasmic reticulum is a high calcium concentration. And inside the mitochondria is not actually a particularly high calcium concentration, despite what my slide says, because I've never actually corrected it. Calcium is released from the endoplasmic reticulum via two calcium channels, which are called, for historical reasons, the rayanidine receptor and the IP3 receptor, inositol trisphosphate receptor, and it's taken back up into the ER by the circa pump, the sarcoid endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. Calcium is heavily buffered in the cytoplasm. It's removed from the cell by pumps here, and it leaks into the cell from the outside through a number of channels. When the agonist binds to cell surface receptors, 
it results in a uh, in the release of, of, of IP3, which is a messenger, which diffuses through the cytoplasm of the cell, binds the IP3 receptors, the calcium rushes out of the ER, the cytoplasma concentration goes up, that turns the IP3 receptors off, whereupon the circuit pumps put the calcium back into the ER. And so by this combination of release of calcium from the ER followed by reuptake, mostly into the ER, that's why the calcium concentration in essence, goes up and down and up and down. We construct models of all this by taking various models of all the bits and pieces and just combining them in fairly standard ways. So, for example, for a protted cell, you'd have a model for a store operated channel, for an IP3 receptor, for a circuit pump, for a plasma membrane pump, but you wouldn't necessarily put in a sodium calcium exchanger because they're not particularly important in salivary gland cells. And so by various selections of which of these modules you want to put in, which elements of the so-called calcium toolbox, you can construct a wide range of different models for different cell types and different, uh, different, set and different contexts. So that's how the calcium goes up and down in short. How does this lead to the secretion of saliva? So here's a slide with a whole bunch of stuff in it. And we're well, not expected to remember all this stuff, of course, but the point is it's, there's a lot of channels and a lot of stuff going on. So in the apical region of the cell here, we get calcium activated chloride channels, as we saw in a previous slide. In the basolateral part of the cell, we have calcium activated potassium channels. We have a sodium potassium um, a chloride co-transporter. We have um, NHE1, which is a, a sodium proton exchanger. We have an anion exchanger in AE4. We also have an AE2, which is not in this, in this picture. And of course, we have the ubiquitous sodium potassium ATPase. Uh, carbon dioxide is buffered, making bicarbonate in the cytoplasm as well. In addition to all those ion channels, we have the calcium control, which we see in the cell on the right agonist activates a, a G protein coupled receptor, which activates a G protein, activates PLC, which stands for phospholipase C, leads to the production of IP3, which diffuses through the cell and binds to IP3 receptors on the endoplasmic reticulum. And these IP3 receptors we've shown experimentally sit very close to the apical region within 50 nanometers of the apical region, of the apical membrane. So they really are very tightly coupled. Now, when we um, write down models for this, we simply write down a set of ODEs at this stage, although as we'll see in a, set, in, in a, in a minute, uh, we can also write down sets of PDEs and solve these on realistic uh, three-dimensional domains. But that's the basic thing. In more schematic form, this is how the how the calcium controls saliva. In the basal region, you get an agonist binding and that's where IP3 is made. IP3 diffuses through the cell. It then binds to IP3 receptors in the apical region. And those IP3 receptors release a lot of calcium. And that is why the calcium wave starts in the apical region always. That initiates uh, a, a calcium wave, which propagates backwards through the cell back to the basolateral region. And there, it, uh, in old models, it activates PLC to make more IP3, and you get a positive feedback process resulting in these sequential waves of calcium going across the cell, which is what you see experimentally in, is in isolated cells and isolated glands. We can solve it in three dimensions. Uh, Sean Means was closely involved in much of the early work with this as was, of course, Evo and Peng Jing. Both of them were closely involved in the construction of the IP3 receptor models and all that kind of stuff. So a big shout out to all those people without whom I would not be here. Thank you all very much. Anyway, John Rugus uh, did these particular computations. You can reconstruct three-dimensional cells and three-dimensional ducts from optical slices, and you can solve the equations on these kinds of uh, domains. Uh, a typical result, for example, would be this. You can see in the movie on the left, you see the calcium waves 
always being initiated in the apical region, which is close to the center of that cluster, which is where the duct is. These calcium waves are spreading through the cell into the basal lateral region, and they do that in some periodic fashion. You can um, plot out, for example, the total fluid flow from these seven cells, and it looks a bit like this. You can check to make sure that all your iron concentrations are what they ought to be, because we know exactly what these iron concentrations should be, and it all works out well. So you get to here and you think, well, here's the model. Here's, um, it all seems to do what we expect it to be doing. We get the right iron concentrations. We get the right looking calcium oscillations, et cetera, et cetera. But there's an enormous but. And this is where the new data comes into play. David Yule just very recently developed this really cool method. You, you breed these super mice that glow in the dark. And when you take a super mouse glowing in the dark and strap it up, still alive, to whatever, I don't know what that is, some sort of microscope thing. I, you know, I'm, I'm not really an experimentalist, okay? But, but David does it. You can, in fact, measure the calcium responses in a living mouse in response to stimulation. And you can stimulate these mice in, in a number of ways. The experiments you'll see here are direct neural stimulation, but we are also trying making them smell a piece of cheese to see whether that works. So that's not actually working particularly well now. Anyway, when you do that, you get something we did not expect. And this is what you see. Here's a typical, here's a typical uh, solution. Uh, and you can see here's a group of cells or a group of, as of acinous cells in the field, five hertz neural stimulation, these colored regions, we've taken out regions of interest from here. And what we get is calcium oscillations in each of these regions, but there are two critical things, two absolutely critical things here. Firstly, the frequency of these oscillations is much, much faster than was ever observed in isolated cells or even in isolated glands. So these SNR cells in a living mouse, they're rocketing along and their calcium oscillations are going really fast with a period of about one second or one and a half seconds, something like that. The second thing you notice is that no longer do we get waves going across the cell. These calcium oscillations are restricted practically entirely to the apical regions. There is no, there is no intracellular calcium wave, so it seems, in living animals. And you can see all the bright bits. They're all in the apical regions. Every so often you get kind of a wave which kind of goes across the cell, but not particularly well. Just about everything is restricted to the apical region. And we can see that more clearly by uh, by looking at one particular cell here. Here's the apical region here. Here's the basal lateral region here. And you can take out two regions of interest, one from the apical region, one from the basal region. And the basal region is the black line. It's flatlining. That's not doing anything. The apical region is oscillating. And by this fairly irregular pattern, that's what I'm calling an oscillation for now. This apical region is oscillating like crazy, perfectly happy, but that is not generating a wave across the cell. And this is not just one cell. This is essentially the result that we found in every single cell we've looked at, without exception. So it seems that the previous dogma is just wrong. So we went for years building up all these models of a calcium wave going across the cell, and it starts in the apical region and ends up in the basal lateral region. And we did that because that's how you can get these cells to secrete water. You had to have calcium activating potassium channels in the basal region. You had to have calcium activating chloride channels in the apical region. The calcium had to do both things. So it had to get across the cell. But these new data says the calcium does not go across the cell. And therefore, the previous explanations of what generates the transport of water, those previous explanations simply don't work anymore. That means we have to come up with a brand new model to explain what's going on. And we haven't done that yet. I mean, when I say we haven't done that, it's it's. Uh, in our heads, but we haven't actually written it down and got it working yet. 
and we certainly haven't got it published. But this is what we claim is going on. We claim, and here's our new, our new model, we claim that the apical region of each cell actually contains all the necessary machinery for saliva secretion. It contains a calcium activated potassium channel, the calcium activated chloride channel. It also contains, we claim, a sodium potassium ATPase, as well as a lot of IP3 receptors jammed up really close to these chloride channels. And we know they're close because we've measured them. There was, as, as I said, it's at least within 50 nanometers, uh, probably closer. And all the other machinery of the cell is way over here in the basal region, which never sees calcium going up, but it doesn't need to because all the necessary machinery sits in the apical region. As it happens, we have other data from previous work where we have shown that these potassium channels probably are here, and these sodium potassium ATPases again probably are here, or probably, certainly, whatever. But we couldn't really make sense of those results before because it didn't fit into the dogma. It didn't fit into what we thought had to be. But with these new results showing us there is, in fact, no calcium wave across the cell, all of a sudden, much of our previous experimental work, as well as these new measurements, it all suddenly starts to make sense. And so we claim that we will be able to write down a model, as shown here, and then provide a consistent explanation for a wide range of previous experimental data, including our results from live mice. Uh, that will explain things that we have found very puzzling before. However, we haven't done it yet. So, you know, you can all keep your fingers crossed and we'll see. So that's kind of me being hopeful. So let's hope that goes. And here's just a list of our uh, of our collaborators, which is the kind of thing you do when you do a lot of experimental work. Obviously, lots of people have been involved in this, but let me repeat my shout out, particularly to Evo and Pengjing and Sean, who have really done an enormous amount of work on this topic over the years. On that happy note, I'll take any questions you might have. Now, do you want me to stop sharing my window, Pengjing? Um... Uh, it's okay. Uh, you can keep that and okay because you finish quite early. Then we have a plenty of time for questions. Yeah, there's a one question. Okay, so um, any questions? Because I found Martin wrote something. Uh, probably Martin is just a. Uh, Hi, Martin. <laughs> yeah, he can't, he can't really talk to you. Okay, so there's uh, another few questions. Pierce is a network problem. So um, one question is uh, from Maurizio is um, um, amazing work. Uh, can you say anything if, if beside the molecular machinery, also there is a polarization in the ER or molecule components? I'm not sure the question. Um, I should say that these cells, we know they are pol polarized and we know that the basolateral membrane contains a whole lot of stuff which the apical membrane doesn't. So the polarization is clear, that's not at question. The real question is, are these calcium activated potassium channels in the apical membrane? And are the sodium potassium ATPases, are they also in the apical membrane? And are the IP3 receptors sitting close enough to the apical membrane to make things work? The answer to all those things is yes. And we have now have experimental evidence that they are in fact there. Now, does that answer your question, or did I just misunderstand you completely? Um, yeah, this is a not good for communications, but we can continue another another question from Martin. Okay. Um, Martin said, nice, "Nice to see you. You you didn't talk about a membrane potential. Does it not have a role?" Oh uh, yeah, 
Nice to see you. Why, well, actually, can't see. I can't see you at all, Martin. But nice to hear your question. And it's a shame I couldn't see you in Berlin last month or when, whenever it was. However, that's how it worked out. Yes, there is a membrane potential in the apical region. The uh, VA, we call it. There's a different membrane potential in the basal region. They are connected by a resistance through a tight junction, which sits round about here. They play an important role. In fact, that's exactly why you need to have these potassium channels, because uh, when calcium activates your chloride channels, chloride flows out, that depolarizes the membrane, and that would stop chloride flow if it was allowed to continue. Instead, the cell also activates potassium channels, which rehyperpolarizes the membrane and allows chloride to keep flowing out. So it's absolutely vital that these membrane potentials of the apical and basal regions are correct. Otherwise, you would not get fluid flow. We know approximately what they are, although it's difficult to measure experimentally, but we have a good idea. And the model, of course, produces uh, approximately the correct apical and basal membrane potentials. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's then another question from VJ. That hi, James. Do you think the distributions of the channels have changed between in vivo and in vitro? Is the shape of the cell different under the microscope? Yeah, so, hey, VJ, that's, um, yes, yeah, so that's a really good question. The answer is we simply don't know yet. Uh, we've, we've only been measuring stuff in live animals for literally a, maybe a couple of months maximum. Um, it got interrupted a bit by the lockdowns and things. And so there's an awful lot we haven't done. We really, at this stage, have no idea why, or we don't know what is different between a cell and a living animal and a cell even in an isolated gland. We can see they behave differently, but we don't know why. Is it because they get stimulated differently? Because remember, if you have an isolated gland or an isolated cell, you stimulate that by just dumping a whole lot of acetylcholine on it. It's like a bath application. But when you stimulate nerves in a living animal, that acetylcholine is released in, in, in a very different way. It's released by the nerve terminals, but we don't know where those nerve terminals are. So we don't know the pattern of the release of acetylcholine. Uh, in the live animal. And it may simply be it's a function of the pattern of agonist release. It may be that the channels and uh, transporters have redistributed themselves. We simply don't know. So I'm sorry I can't be more helpful, but it's a really good question. Okay, uh, we have one, one more question. Uh, probably a few more, but uh, one from... Uh from Rudingato, uh, on one of your earlier slides, it looks like there is an intracellular IPS3 transport. Uh, it is, uh, is this right or, and if so, can you see coupled cell dynamics? Yeah, another really good question, Rudiger. Hi again. Um, uh, yes, we do know that IP3 goes from cell to cell in isolated cells, because we've done those experiments. But that's isolated cells. We have not done those experiments in living animals, so we simply don't know. Uh, on the other hand, even in isolated cells, there's very little evidence that the coupling of these cells by the intercellular diffusion of IP3 is really having much of an effect. Calcium, as we've known for a long time, really doesn't go from cell to cell effectively at all. So coupling by calcium is not really relevant, certainly not here. Coupling by IP3 happens, but how relevant it is, probably not very. And in live animals, we simply don't know. There's no evidence that you get synchronization of calcium responses across multiple cells. So, Okay, uh, we have too many questions, but we, we, we do not have time to actually answer all. And saying, saying thank James for this wonderful talk. And uh, if you have any further question, you can post it on, on the neural stars. Okay. Cool. Thanks very much, Joel. Bye bye. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I will invite Sean. Next yeah, speaker, so it is Sean. now um, time to introduce our next speaker. So we have heard a bit about Sean Means already. Okay.
Um, and um, I met Sean when I started as a postdoc in Auckland. And as James already mentioned, um, Sean was working in this big project on saliva secretion as well. And we could say that Sean made the biggest contribution to this project. He put everything together to a three-dimensional model of a full salivary gland, whereas I actually made the smallest contribution. I made a model of just one ion channel. And um, at that time, Sean did his PhD with James Sneed. Um, I don't remember exactly. Did you finish in around 2013? Oh, it was 2011. 2011. Okay. Yeah. I, I thought I was actually about to leave when, when you did your PhD. Okay. So you did your PhD in 2011. And then um, I think you worked at um, the University of uh, Auckland as a postdoc for a while with um, Leo Cheng yep. um, on slow waves of calcium in the interstitial cells of Caral. So oh, it's in yes. the duct, uh, in, the, in the intestines. Yep. And um, I think recently you then moved to Massey University. Mm. Yep, up at Massey, uh, doing very different things, not calcium. Yes, but today you will mostly talk about calcium. Yes, that seems to be the thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we look forward to your talk. Um, thanks a lot. Okay, so I need to share this thing. Okay, so I'm, I'm guessing you can see this okay. Uh, but so, um, yes, I have not done uh, calcium in some time. I'm doing rather different things. And I suppose it's unfortunate that I get to follow James with such an interesting talk with so many implications for doing modeling. Um, it reminds me of some of the stuff that I've been working on recently on uh, liver disease and how the... Um, the structure of the liver itself influences whether or not hepatocytes when they're in culture actually remain hepatocytes. And a lot of the data that we've been getting uh, from that arena is also greatly influenced on whether or not the cells are in, in situ. Uh, so aside from that, uh, I've noticed that over the years as I did uh, work on calcium, there was a theme and stuff that I was doing and had a lot to do with space. <laughs> and just different spatial distributions, geometries, and of course, diffusive coupling and the way they conspired to, to perform various actions throughout different kinds of cells, uh, particularly say the, the spit cells that I worked on with James. But I, I'm not really gonna talk about the, the SNR cell stuff that I did. Instead, I thought I would just show some, uh, some of the other work that I've done and uh, sort of emphasize this theme of space. But like I said, I haven't done uh, much calcium stuff in a while. So some of these things are gonna be a rather trip down nostalgia lane for myself and for others, maybe aware of some of these things. So um, previously before I came to New Zealand and I studied with James, I was working at uh, Sandia National Labs in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And the, uh, the folks over at the UNM Cancer Research Center, they came to us and they said, we're seeing some interesting things with cultured cells. And these were uh, uh, leukemia cells where they were, stimulated or they had their endoplasmic reticulum calcium stores uh, exhausted and the IP3R channels on the surface of these things would cluster. They would form these aggregations and move about in the ER membranes. And so they, they could see that the, uh, the calcium release that occurred when these were clustered on the surface of the ER, the amount of cytosolic calcium was simply lower. And so it's like just less calcium was coming out of these things. But so um, they were intrigued on what was happening on the inside of the ER. And they could not uh, see what was calcium doing in the endoplasmic uh, reticulum lumen. So what we did is we did some uh, good old fashioned tilt tomography series, just tracing out the, these filamentary structures, the ER and these images, and then did some uh, segmentation to build this Hi, lovely Sean. surface. Sean, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I can only see your first slides, but I can't oh. see it. Have you? Yeah, so you're stuck on the first slide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's I don't know what to do about that. <laughs> But I thought you that must not be very exciting. Let's see, what if I do this? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's do yeah. I have to that's can okay. you see the next slide? Yeah, yeah, a long time ago in a publication far, far away. Okay, but can you see I've changed slides? <laughs> okay, so maybe, maybe we have to try it this way. Okay, okay, okay so yeah. this okay. is an image that I was describing earlier <laughs> that has all these IP3R clusters and then how calcium levels were lower when they were clustered.
And then at Sandia, we did these reconstructions of the the ER filamentary structures. So did segmentations and then got a surface out of that thing. And in fact, uh, seeing this uh, triggers uh, more than a few memories of staring at it far too many times. But so what we did is uh, some finite element simulations, nothing uh, terribly fancy. I won't show you all the reaction diffusion equations, but it was the standard standard uh, array of, of buffers and calcium pumps and whatnot, but particularly looking at the different distributions of these IP3R channels, either they were diffuse and homogeneously distributed over this surface that we had reconstructed. This left pane shows the interior concentrations within the ER, and then this is the cytosolic concentrations, and then did the same thing, but with um, the clustered versions. So we just aggregated them into clusters, the same channels, everything else pretty much the same, responding just to a constant uh, two micromolar IP3 across. And so I can't seem to do some things uh, that I was used to doing uh, because I'm not in the display mode, but we can at least see the, the transient plots and say, well, there's less calcium that's dumped out of the ER when we're in clustered mode, as opposed to how much calcium comes out when we're in diffuse mode. And of course the peak values and the overall values for when uh, the IP3R are diffusely distributed over the ER, you get more calcium coming out of these things. And that's related, of course, to the IP3R model that we use. So this was some time ago, and we used a five-state model from 94 that was fit to then current data. Um, and we did a couple of different fits where we had different inactivation rates responding to this IP3. So this was a relatively fast inactivation scheme. So by far, most of these channels are in a refractory state. But if we uh, fit with a slower inactivation so that most of these channels were actually open in this diffuse configuration, we actually would get emptying of the ER. And so most of the calcium is just dumped out of those things. But so that wasn't terribly surprising. That wasn't so much what uh, the folks were interested in at UNM Cancer Research. They were more interested in what's happening on the inside of the ER, what uh, sort of gradients are being formed. And it turns out that these interluminal calcium gradients, uh, either in the diffuse or the cluster version, are pretty comparable. They're pretty much the same. Uh, and all this is just the difference between the peak and the and the low values of calcium within the ER geometry. And this this enhanced version uh, is just showing this little uh, depletion of calcium in this cul-de-sac in this convoluted tortured geometry. But it turns out that because of the buffering inside the ER, the geometry isn't uh, terribly important. <laughs> So that, that was actually handy down the road when we started using homogenization techniques. So we don't really need to worry too much about the actual geometries in there. So that was one bit. Another bit that I got to work on was um, uh, with a fellow Leighton Izu over in uh, Maryland. I think it was a John Hopkins at the day, at the time. And he uh, got a hold of this uh, lovely light microscop microscopy image of an atrial cell that's stimulated and we get calcium released throughout the atrial cell and of course the calcium sparks and whatnot. And what uh, Leighton was interested in is how when we get enough of these sparks to aggregate together, you get formation of calcium waves. There should be one forming about here that traverse across the cell and you can get, um, this This leads to heart arrhythmias or it has something, some uh, correlations with the disruption of the electrical coupling and the calcium release that can be problematic for the function of the heart. And so he was interested in looking at the influence of spatial distribution on the formation of these waves. And particularly, of course, in atrial cells, there's a distinct spatial uh, structure and organization of these calcium release sites, also known as the ranadine receptors that uh, James mentioned. Uh, these things uh, have a distinct distribution along these so-called Z lines, and these striations are, have a distinct distance between them as well. But so the, along this transversal distance, we're looking at uh, the distances between 0.8 and about one micron between them. And running some preliminary simulations, we could see that as those distances are less, you get more calcium. And that's uh, simply because uh, they're sensitive to the amount of surrounding calcium. So you get more calcium next to an RAR, it tends to open more frequently. And so you would get more calcium. And the other aspect of this uh, that was of interest is what happens when these cells contract? and the longitudinal distances can vary quite a bit. Uh, these particular ones we were looking at were between 1.6 and two microns. And so what's of interest is whether or not if these are in a contracted state, if you get a higher probability of getting a calcium wave formation. So of course we threw together a finite element simulation and uh, this particular uh, version here is with a two micron distance between these planes, 
of the ryanodyne receptors are what we call the calcium release units because they're actually aggregates of several RARs. And this is a variety of the parameters that we use, but perhaps uh, of greater interest is the diffusion rate along the, the axis of this cylindrical representation is faster. So it's anisotropic diffusion as opposed to the diffusion along the radius, which is slower. These three panes are just gonna show different uh, concentrations of calcium. We initiated the, uh, the, the whole process by letting these individual RERs in the upper outside radius fire and release calcium. These isosurfaces are showing the different concentrations at different levels, 15 micro, micromolar. This is a variety of them, but just shown from the side so you can see how far along the calcium reaches to the neighboring Z line. And this two micromolar isosurface indicates whether or not you should see stimulation of a neighboring RAR. And so this particular distance here where there's two microns between these two Z planes, we don't get a well-organized wave. Uh, it takes a while, maybe about 95 milliseconds or so before it starts, starts to form some sort of wave. But the stimulations that are happening over on this Z plane across from the one that we started or more, it's essentially started with just a, a random stochastic uh, activation. And that's how we simulated these RERs. It was just based on a basic open probability model, drew a random number and just saw whether or not they would fire. But so what we did is then uh, compared this with a contracted version of, of this <laughs> cardiac section, this atrial cell section, all other parameters being the same, just put them closer together. And if you watch these, you can see these ISO services are reaching to the neighboring Z line and we get a stimulation and we get formation of a rather coherent wave front um, with everything else being the same, they're just closer together. And so looking at the influence of the spatial distances between these and also increasing the current and the strengths of these calcium release sites, you could see that um, as you shrink uh, the distances between them, the chances of getting an unstable formation or, or unstable releases and formation of a calcium wave increases. And so you just get this partition between the Z line distances and the currents. And of course those have uh, implications for heart arrhythmias and whatnot. So that was uh, another thing that I got to work on uh, before I came along to uh, New Zealand. I worked with James on more calcium. Uh, this particular uh, version of calcium investigations was on uh, intestinal cells. As, uh, as uh, Evo mentioned, I got to play with these things called the interstitial cells of Cajal that were discovered by uh, Santiago Ramon Cajal way back in the 19th century, whose particular role wasn't really established for over a century, uh, that these, these networks of cells, these little fellows intercalated between the layers of muscle and intestines here, they are driving pacemaking cells and they are, they are issuing pacemaking contraction <laughs> signals to the surrounding smooth muscle. And they're actually quite critical for gastric motility. So it's generally as we get older, these networks of ICC cells diminish and you get less motility. Uh, but so there's a correlation between the, the depolarization signals for the surrounding smooth muscle cells and also these intracellular calcium traces. The ICC are producing these membrane depolarizations um, by some mechanism involving calcium. And so it's presumed that uh, it, partly because of the time spans for these things, that it has something to do with endoplasmic reticulum calcium depletions. And that seemed to make sense looking at some of the structures within these ICC. And this is an image just showing uh, there's a tight packing of a lot of mitochondria wrapped around an endoplasmic reticulum filament here, forming what, uh, what was called a, a pacemaker pocket or a pacemaking unit, a PMU, where we had endoplasmic reticulum mitochondria and the plasma membrane forming these little regions. And it was theorized that these were critical for uh, containment of uh, cytosolic calcium and also establishing timescales of ER calcium depletions. So what we did is we looked to see what is the influence of different uh, geometric configurations, say the number of mitochondria, and also whether or not uh, these PMUs for it a tight weld with the, uh, with the plasma membrane. So this particular simulation, a two-dimensional simulation, has a rather large gap here between the pacemaking unit and the rest of the bulk cytosol, which is the surrounding in these lovely mitochondria holes. And so if I could stop this where I wanted, uh, I could show you that there's a large orifice between the pacemaking unit and where this thing is firing off these uh, simulations with the IP3R model, 
that's based on Evo's model from uh, 2012, the, the two-phase uh, six-state model that we solved with some uh, hybrid Gillespie method. But so um, this particular simulation would drive these concentrations up rather high because the number of mitochondria are not as many as with another simulation with far more mitochondria. And also in this particular geometric configuration, there was a, a much tighter gap between this pacemaking region and also the uh, the surrounding bulk cytosols. So there's this basically a smaller diffusive aperture for the calcium to go through to get into the surrounding bulk cytosome. And so of course, since there's more mitochondria that are pulling the calcium out of the cytosol, it also uh, controls how much calcium is getting into the cytosol. So we don't see as high of concentrations overall. And this is a, a rather busy little scatter plot just showing some of the different configurations that we tested where we had 15 mitochondria, five mitochondria, one mitochondria, either in an open PMU with a rather large aperture to let calcium diffuse through into the bulk cytosol or a closed, closed pacemaking unit. And we also varied the amount of circuit protein that were in um, on the endoplasmic reticulum to pull the calcium back into the ER, uh, nobody knows how much circa are, are in the ICC. So it just used ranges that were comparable to those observed in cardiac cells and also varied the amount of IP3 signal that are applied to these things. And so of course, with more mitochondria, we get less cytosolic calcium than with uh, fewer mitochondria. And here in the solo mitochondria, the amount of calcium in these is, is quite high. It's well over one micromolar. This is semi-log. And so the, the thing of interest was, well, how does this calibrate uh, depletion cycles? And so therefore also the pacemaking timescales for these. So what this scatter plot is showing, those depletion cycles per minute over this variety of these different uh, configurations with either low or high circa and high IP3 or low IP3 signals, and the three different geometric uh, configurations with um, lots of mitochondria or a few mitochondria. And so it looks like what we were seeing is that overall, statistically, the differences between the open and the closed pacemaking configurations are overall fairly comparable. There are a few exceptions where we get some statistical differences, but overall, they're pretty comparable. And so what we were seeing is that it's not so much the geometric configuration that's as important as the competition between the circa that's pulling the calcium back into the ER and the mitochondria that's pulling it away and, and ends up depleting the endoplasmic reticulum. And so that seemed to be what was calibrating as well as the IP3 signals, so how strong the IP3 was uh, stimulating the IP3R channels. And so we could get cycles that were comparable to some human, uh, what was it, three, three cycles per minute or up to murine intestinal and, and um, so forth, so we had 20 cycles per minute and so forth. So I guess the upshot of all this, sometimes space is important and sometimes it isn't. <laughs> uh, so, so seeing from the, the IP3R clustering is that indeed um, as, they, as they float around in the ER membranes and they influence each other from a close proximity, it mitigates ER calcium loss. They just, uh, they tend to go refractory far more often according to that model that we used. And also those uh, geometric effects of the ER are, are damped by buffering. And that's certainly handy for homogenization techniques, which is what was used in the ICC modeling. Also, um, for particularly for uh, considering heart arrhythmias, if um, someone's uh, calcium release units are particularly strong uh, amperage, then they may be more susceptible to getting arrhythmias because perhaps um, it can account for the contractions and working with a stronger calcium release and actually get more calcium wave formations and decoupling between the electrical signals and the calcium signals. And then also the, the idea of um, formation of, of pacemaking pockets against the, the plasma membrane and the specific geometries as being important for, for calibrating gastrointestinal pacing, it doesn't appear, the, appear to be the case. It's just something as, uh, something as simple as just how many circas are competing with how many mitochondria. And so that's uh, my little trip down nostalgia. Lane, and uh, thanks for having me along. It's it's really lovely to be uh, speaking with so many brilliant calcium uh, speakers, and uh, particularly um, uh, hard to follow James, but I did my best. <laughs> so if anybody has questions on all this stuff, just let me know. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sean. Okay, uh, we've got uh, ten minutes. Ten minutes. So. Plenty of time for questions. Um, there's uh, two questions at the moment. 
So one question from uh, Rajan. Uh, hi, Sean, could you please give some details on the right of clustering and uh, declustering of IP3 receptor or other oh. channels? Also, like the, the time scales for them to cluster, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea how long it took for them to migrate through the membranes. That, that would be very interesting. <laughs> but so that, that apparently wasn't an aspect that was, that was looked at. Although that, that would be a very interesting bit to look at. Yeah, yeah. OK. Done. And uh, another uh, question from Martin. Hi, Sean. Nice simulation in the atrial cell. Uh, when they are contracted and cytoplasmic calcium is still high, how does this affect the jumping of the waves between the Z discus? Oh, so in the contracted state. So we're at um, this 1.6 micron, say. So I guess, um, how does that affect? I'm not sure I understand. So. So how does the cytosolic uh, calcium affect the what? I'm not sure. The affect the jumping of the Y between the two panels. Is so this is this the right one? Is this the right thing that ask being asked about? Um, so Martin, you can write some in the chat or write some comments to clarify the question if you want. Oh, OK. Oh, yeah. yes. OK, so I, I guess all that's really happening here is, is it, I guess it's, it's dependent on the, the RER model that we used. And it was basically, this is a sigmoidal curve, uh, uh, computing the, the prob that open probability where we've got a half maximal sensitivity at like 15 micromolar. And then there's like, um, it was shaped to a, a maximum probability of a spark of like 0.3 per millisecond. And if I remember correctly, we took fixed time steps and it's just as we marched over those time steps, um, we computed that probability according to the sigmoidal curve, depending on what was the local calcium concentration. And so the those probabilities of triggering an RAR firing, are, of course, are a function of how much calcium there is. And so these, for instance, this Z plane that's starting to light up, those are just seeing higher probabilities as we draw the randoms that they're going to fire. And that's distinct from, say, this non-contracted state where if you watch the Z plane, there's really no elevations that are happening here. And in fact, all that happens is we just we just get a random firing. So this that that R that R A R C R U just actually fired randomly. It just it was just a happenstance that that one did. Does that does that clarify it? And the, oh, in the contracted state, cytosolic calcium is high anyway. Uh, I guess I, what I'm looking at is also just the isosurfaces themselves. So, so let's say this this isosurface here is two micromolar, and so the the way the CRUs were modeled, they basically turned on and uh, kept going. <laughs> there was no in inactivation curve for these, um, as you you're probably aware. Like the the IP3Rs, they have a, they have the bell curve inactivation, whereas the RERs don't. And so these things just kept firing, and and that's partly why we stuck with um, these only go out to 100 milliseconds. And so the what what happens is ahead of that wave front, ahead of this two micromolar wave front, um, the the calcium concentrations are the baseline uh, as they're slowly rising. Um, but I don't show those concentrations less than two, except there's a one micromolar isosurface here. So you can see there's one micromolar that's dancing around this thing, but it's it's likely it's ahead of this wavefront. And as you're ahead of the wavefront, those concentrations are below one micromolar, and it's and there's probably a really stiff, stiff wavefront where those concentrations are going up. Oh, does it does that answer your question? <laughs> okay, um, let's move on to another question. Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. So at at school pin ask another question. So do you see a high isoconcentration wave closer to the ER membrane? Uh, which which aspect are we talking about? A high calcium concentration close to the ER membrane? Is it for these fellows, for the, the ER simulations? Um, so Alex, are you there? So high iso concentration wave, I think it's calcium. 
Yes. Oh, so it's in these simulations. Okay. Hmm. You know, I I'd have to think back to what the concentrations we saw at these channel mouths. If I remember correctly, they were on the order of like a hundred micromolar or something. They were quite quite high. But these these simulations were also with I think they had mobile buffers in the cytosol, so there was calmodulin running around, and I think we also had um, or is it calmodulin? Calmodulin in the cytosol and cal reticulin in the um, inside the ER lumen. So I, th I think we had mobile in both of them. But so I think we also represented mitochondria as just a homogeneous sink throughout. But once uh, you got past a certain range, I, honestly, I don't remember. It's been a while since I played with these. How far out, what what those distances were for those peak values for them to decay, uh, um, I, I honestly don't remember. I'm sure it was on the order of like tens to maybe 100 nanometers or something that those peak concentrations would drop off pretty, pretty rapidly. And of course, that, that was a function of just how exhausted the, the mobile buffers and whatnot would be. As these as these things progressed, because um, this this was a closed system, uh, or maybe I might be lying to you. I think there were plasma membrane pumps, but um, nothing more than just the the PMCA. So no, it wasn't a closed system. Sorry. But does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Oh, for the ER simulations, yeah. Um, so that was. That was a 2006 paper in Biophysical Journal that was uh, with Bridget Welsian, and um, she was the UNM person. Let's see. OK, so uh, one last question um, from Wei sure. uh, okay. Great talk, uh, Sin. Uh, in all, uh, what is it? I can't. OK, so in all, in all cells, you have modeled, you have modeled do you think that density or number of channels is more important than their distribution? Well, I guess that's a combination of things, A, eh? because it because the, the ICC stuff that I was looking at, it looked uh, particularly regarding circa, it looked like the densities of circas were 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 critical. But you know, honestly, we didn't look at the distributions. Um, but I, I've never really considered distributions of, of circas. It usually we focus on the distributions of the ion channels. That's usually the the thing that uh, that is more of a concern. But I would say with what we saw for the for the ER geometry simulations, where we reconstructed the ER and had the realistic geometries and so forth, seeing these uh, the influence of just having them either diffuse over the surface or having them clustered, I, I would say that in this instance the 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 distribution is more important, but. I guess it's also a function of like, well, what sort of densities are you talking about? Are they very dense and there's tons of them packed into a, a tiny space or is it really not quite so dense and you, you have them uh, kind of compacted into a cluster, but it's just not that many. So I guess it's, I guess it depends. You know, it depends on the, the circumstances and, and just how many you're talking about. Uh, so there's another question. Uh, okay, so you would like to answer. Um, yeah, we have one, one more minute. Okay. So, uh, Marizio's question, or you want to the Rudinger's question? So you can basically see the two questions. Okay, how do I see the questions? Oh, I see. Yeah. So you can decide which one is easier to answer. <laughs> easier. <laughs> uh, oh, diffusion in the ER. I I think we cheated. I think what we did is we used the cytosolic and that we did we did some sort of estimate on i think it was a reduced estimate it was it was some rather crude calculation on on um i think based on on just the the geometric convolution or, or i don't remember exactly that that was a while ago but i think we just basic based it on the cytosolic and reduced it somehow based on some some sort of hand wavy reasoning yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think okay. that's pretty much Thank all. you for having me along. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Yeah, we will um, invite Alex. Hi, Alex. Hello. Hello. Uh, nice to meet you. Um, so can you share your screen now? Try if it's... Yeah. I'm trying. Okay. 
Yes. Okay, I can see that. Yes, it's okay. Okay, wait, ah, sorry. okay. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. And uh, okay, oh, uh, we can start. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah. So, um, thanks for yeah. uh, thanks for the invitation. And uh, um, since it's my first Halstim talk um, after um, the death of Michael Barrage, so I decided to give a subtitle so um, to my talk here uh, as a life and death approach, which is obviously meant to be a homage for the landmark work of uh, Michael. So um, as we all know, and that was nicely also introduced uh, by uh, James and uh, Sean, so calcium is a central life and death signal, so that encodes external signals into intracellular responses. And then we have already seen, so the machinery here, so which is here visualized as the IP3 pathway and the calcium induced calcium release mechanism. Um, and so also shown extensively here in this workshop, so that Calcium is very often frequency encoded and involved in a lot of different uh, physiological processes that start at the beginning of life and then is acting on transcription differentiation as well as then on mitochondrial activity, motility, synaptic plasticity, and also the cell death. So um, while this is obviously then driven by the interplay between the channel dynamics and the cellular dynamics, as well as other buffer mechanisms, as uh, uh, Sean has just uh, shown in his talk. So um, where we started all, or our whole community started out, so from the Barrage uh, investigation, so about calcium being a central signal, and then the oscillation mechanism, and then there has been several um, approaches from the modeling side, so where, of course, uh, James and Martin has been drivers for this whole, uh, for this whole uh, yeah, com community, in but here also uh, Goldpeter and Genevieve Dupont have contributed significantly to our understanding, where mainly, so the early models were mainly considering so this oscillation mechanism as a hops bifurcation that is driven by the repeating emptying of the ER and refilling, which then leads to these um, cytosolic calcium spikes. So um, what uh, I have done then extensively with Martin over the last, uh, well, it's actually a decade or so now, is that we have looked into the spatial heterogeneity and the effects. So as just uh, shown also by Sean before, so that the loca localization of release channels and buffer uh, mechanisms so can have an impact on the cellular uh, behavior, which has then these different levers, levels from the channels to the channel clusters or release and uh, sync clusters then up to the, uh, the cellular level. And what we have shown then is that uh, these single channel fluctuations can actually drive the cellular dynamics and is leading them to some stochasticity. So what you can see here is now the uh, fluorescent signal of an uh, individual astrocytes uh, uh, over uh, nearly up to, to an hour. And if you look into the interspike interval, so we see that uh, there is some random part to it. So what we then have done is that we have looked more systematically into these fluctuations by plotting now the standard deviation of these interspike intervals over the mean period for different cell types. So here you see four, but in the meantime, we have done the same exercise for the 12 different cell types. And what we always see there is that we see a linear dependency of the standard deviation of the average period. So, and then this is indicated by the rather high correlation coefficients here. And if you have a closer look, you see also that there is this gap so uh, here, so that means that corresponds to do the minimal interspike interval, where that I should have mentioned that where each dot corresponds to the spike train of an individual cell. Another, if you look closer then, so you, you see also that this dependency can have a different slope. So where we so far mainly see that spontaneous oscillations like here in the astrocytes and the microglia have a slope of one, meaning so that the uh, range of the average uh, of the average is uh, in the similar range as the standard deviation, which is a clear indicator for a stochastic process. And so we could understand this mechanism rather well by considering a time-dependent Poissonian process. So, but Martin will uh, speak about this more uh, more in a little bit detail. But the important message here is so that um, calcium spiking can be stochastic and significantly stochastic and that there is a pathway in cell-type-specific slope of uh, this stochastic characteristics here. 
So if you then uh, think about, uh, again, about the importance of calcium, so in this frequency coding paradigm, so the question is, so how does the stochasticity of calcium induce calcium release, as well as encoding relation of the stochastic process that Martin will touch later on, how, what is the impact of that on uh, on the cell? Where I will focus here mainly on two on two things. So the one is mitochondrial activation. So where we know from the other landmark work uh, from Thomas, so that calcium triggers mitochondrial activity. And on the other side, we will also look into what is the effect, potential effect, about the stochasticity on gene expression, meaning on on cell fate. So starting with the mitochondrial activation uh, thing, so we know that there is this crosstalk between the calcium dynamics and mitochondrial um, yeah, um, uh, effectiveness and mitochondrial dynamics, which is driven by, on the one hand, by calcium is uh, influencing the membrane potential of mitochondria and thereby pushing ATP production. And on the other hand, the ATP is needed for calcium homeostasis, um, so mainly for the pumping, uh, for the pumps, the zircon pumps, to pump back the calcium into the endoplasmic reticulum as well. So meaning here we uh, look into the connection between signaling and metabolism. So where we, we know, so, or, so just a basic uh, biology thing, so that uh, cells take up glucose, do um, the glycolysis to generate pyruvate, and then pyruvate is a substrate for the metabolism with the mitochondria. So we started to look into that into more detail by a, mecha by a mechanistic crosstalk model. So where the interaction between mitochondria and uh, the cytosol is mediated by the mitochondrial calcium unit transporter, the MCU, and the sodium calcium exchanger here. So which is then added to uh, the model and the whole model has uh, seven variables that also includes then uh, the main important components uh, in the flavor of James' talk. And we use, uh, for, for this, we use a rather uh, yes, well, standard model, so slightly adapted, but uh, which can be seen as uh, yeah, so based on the shoulders of um, uh, Goldpeter, James, and, and all the other great works that has been done there. So that's the calcium model and then for the mitochondrial model. So we adapted the Bertram model that was for better cells and plugged these two models together and then including the included this crosstalk. So meaning that mitochondrial, um, so taking up the calcium from the cytosol and um, the AT produced ATP is then needed for, for the Zerka pumps. So then you see that here the uh, mitochondrial calcium concentration is following the spiking behavior of the cytosol, and that you see here the push for ATP production based on the mitochondrial cal calcium concentration. So having this model um, parameterized, so we could use then this model to look into the um, yeah, interdependence of these two pathways, so between signaling and metabolism. And as a first start, we looked how does the modified ATP production is acting on the calcium dynamics. And to mimic that, so we then uh, played around with the substrate of mitochondrial metabolism, so meaning the pyruvate. And if you use that into the model, so what you see is that if you have, if the cell has a high mitochondrial substrate, so a higher pyruvate um, concentration, so we would expect the cells to spike uh, slower and uh, this is slightly higher amplitude compared to mitochondria um, that has a lower um, pyruvate concentration. So then you can uh, make here some statistics out of it. So by uh, running different sets of these cells by different, uh, slightly different parameterization. And then again, you see so that uh, low substrate leads to uh, faster spiking and uh, has then also leading to the ATP, different ATP concentration. Um, so we then used um, different cell types. So I show here, uh, here to uh, something that we have done in astrocytes um, because so many people were talking yesterday about astrocytes. And what you see actually is confirming our prediction. So where the experiments where we put the cells into a glucose rich medium, so meaning that there can be a lot of pyruvate production. So we actually observed on average a, a slower spiking compared to the uh, low or not uh, to the scenario where cells only can run on, on glutamine. 
So and then again, you can do the statistics for that, and we also see that then cells run into ATP, ATP depletion. Meaning here, um, there is kind of a comp uh, compensating mechanism. So meaning that if the cell is not as rich in substrates, so calcium is faster to push uh, ATP concentration by uh, production by mitochondria. So we then also tried the other way around and uh, looked how does uh, modified calcium, how does different calcium signals act on the ATP production. So, and for this one, so uh, we use then metabolic, uh, metabolomics, and we're measuring the flux, the uptake flux from, from glucose and, and glutamine. So what you see here is that we now stimulated cells um, with different concentrations. So, and we're measuring then um, the frequency or the periods of the calcium spiking. And at the same time, we then measure, measure the glucose uptake. And you see already here, so there is a nice correlation and if you plot this, uh, this dependency, so we see um, this kind of sigmoidal relationship uh, for astrocytes for the glucose uptake independent on the uh, calcium dynamics. So, of course, we did this and also with other uh, cell types and other stimulations. And what we always ended up with this kind of behavior where we see the sigmoidal behavior um, for, for um, yeah, so substrate uptake um, in the cells based on, on the spiking period. So meaning that here we see again this mechanism so that external stimuli are encoding a calcium signal and that this calcium signaling can then uh, be used for uh, the decoding in terms of metabolic flux. So if we uh, now look or if we now plot this uh, dependency over the frequency, so we see that this shape is rather similar to the enzyme activity dependency that is shown uh, here on the right, where you see that also you observe uh, sigmodal uh, behavior, for instance, with the ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. So, um, and we know that this is also true for some other um, enzymes within the um, TCA cycle. Meaning from this perspective here, um, the idea is that the calcium signals are actually kind of integrated within the mitochondria and then translated into a metabolic flux. So what we then also uh, did is that we looked into uh, this modeling, we looked into the uh, mitochondrial activity and the circumstances and then with the deterministic model. So we ended up with this relationship here where you see that we have this breakdown uh, or the stop here based on the Hopf bifurcation and also performing uh, intensive um, parameter sweeps, we were not able to actually fill this gap that we see in the experiments. So meaning this uh, low metabolic activity was always an, uh, stopped. So we could actually then we start or come back or mimic the experimental condition very uh, much better when we again use the stochastic approach, meaning that we uh, put the cells into uh, phase lock states and then added noise on the release channels. And then actually, as you can see here, so the sigmodal behavior can be retrieved, which is another uh, indicator, at least uh, from my perspective, so that the stochasticity in calcium dynamics has actually an essential role. So, um, we also used then our model um, to look into a physiological scenario. So where we had a collaboration with Oliver Dantman from Sheffield that were looking into um, the uh, death of dopaminergic neurons that are the key feature of Parkinson's disease. And um, PINK1 is one of these genes that has a central role in, in, in Parkinson's disease. And what they observed is so compared to a wild type, the mutant where um, pink one is knocked out. So you see a large death of these dopaminergic neurons that could be actually rescued by a knockdown of the mitochondrial unit, uh, calcium unit transporter. So um, this is quantified here. So where you see the number of dopaminergic neurons is significantly decreased uh, in, the, in the mutants and that could be rescued then by um, knocking down the mitochondrial unit transporter. So um, we then used our model and mimicked the situation. So where you see here, so the pink one effect is leading to a, a lower respiration activity uh, of mitochondria that can, could then be restored by uh, mimicking an MCU uh, knockdown. 
So, and again, so here you see the quantification. And with these numbers here, we were able to match the experimental observation at least qualitatively. So on, uh, so well, maybe here as, as a point, so that is also in line with uh, the Suomaya hypothesis in the PD field, in the Parkinson field, that is claiming that the perturbed calcium homeostasis has a major effect on the disease progression. So on the other uh, leg here, so we were also looking, so how does calcium dynamics has an effect on, on, on cell fate. And so that's based on this vision about uh, the epigenetic landscape where a stem cell is then based on the environmental clues that it gets is differentiating into different uh, cell types. And we were now asking, so what is the role of calcium in, in, this, uh, in this behavior? So and to do that, so we performed single cell RNA-seq based on our established drop-seq approach. And what's happening in this approach is so that you generate uh, uh, many, many droplets and a microfluidics device, and then you capture in these droplets, you capture individual cells and beads, and each bead has a protea tail with which you can capture the mRNAs of the cell. And based on the unique barcode here, we can then perform multiplex sequencing and end up with a digital expression matrix where we get then the transcriptome for thousands of cells and have a coverage of up to 20,000 genes. So we applied this methodology then to uh, the EPC and climate transitions, so which is essential um, in development, in wound healing, but has also a major role in cancer invasion, where this EPC cells that are building the tissue can switch into a mesenchymal cells that has higher stemness character. And these mesenchymal cells are also motile. So meaning the metastasis idea is so that these uh, tumor, tumor cells switch into the mesenchymal state, they crawl into the blood flow, go somewhere else, and then make the in a reverse transition into an epithelial cells and build the secondary tumor. So, and for this system, so what, where you can see here uh, a micro microscopy picture, so where the PC cells are Z cells here that form again a tissue like structure, and in green you see the mesenchymal cells. And based on previous work, so we have then also a very clear identification, so which cells correspond to which cell state. So we then we're using our uh, perfusion system so to actually trigger different calcium signals and then looked into the behavior of this uh, phenotype switch between epithelial to mesenchymal and vice versa. And that was done in an automated way where we build up this perfusion system and this perfusion system allowed us now to synchronize cell culture. Well, you should see here some blinking, uh, so here it's coming, to synchronize cell cultures by now perfusing the cell cultures with either ATP, histamine, or also some carbacol stuff. And as you can see here, so we are very really nicely or are nicely able to trigger different calcium responses in within the cells, where you see here an example for one minute. Okay, PowerPoint crashed. That's not what I wanted. Well, I can give you just briefly then uh, the main message of that, what, 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 what we have done uh, in uh, this setup, so is that we were perturbing the system um, uh, with different calcium signatures. No, PowerPoint is not uh, coming up. Uh, we're perturbing this, the system with different signatures. And um, what we ob actually observed is so that, first of all, we could um, re refine the frequency encoding, meaning so that if we looked into the number of differentially expressed genes compared to the control condition where we have no stimulation, so no calcium trigger. So we see an increase in the number of differentially expressed genes, but actually, so the more, so the higher we uh, perturb the system, the larger the effect becomes. But the most astonishing effect that we have seen there is that if we compare a stochastic pattern with a regular spiking pattern, so we see that there is a huge boost in cellular heterogeneity, meaning that then having the stochastic signatures are activating many more pathways and so that there is a much higher regula uh, regulation on, on the cell level where we could then show that um, in one direction, so having past 
spiking oscill oscillatory behavior is inducing an MET, so an mesenchymal to epithelial transition. So, and is also then inducing apoptosis that might be not so surprising. But again, there we see that mitochondrial expression is uh, modified strongly. So, and on the other hand, we ha could sh show that having a slow stochastic spike pattern, so it's actually inducing um, the uh, opposite, so the EMT, so the epithelial to mesenchymal transition, that uh, can then have, may have also some beneficial clinical outcome. So, and with this, I thank the people, the work I could not show here, and I apologize for this PowerPoint hiccup. Okay. Thank, thank you, Alex. And uh, now we have few questions. The first question is, uh, is, is James from James Nick. Uh, so a lovely demonstration of the importance of stochastic models. I'm curious about why there is such a difference. Do you have any insight about this? Well, um, so the, the, so on, I think the one on the mitochondrial activity is really based on this uh, smear out of the Hopf bifurcation. Right, so because in the Hopf bifurcation, so you have this all at one point the all or nothing behavior. So where then the noise can smear out, um, so this drastic uh, stop of any activity. So for the gene expression uh, analysis, so the stochasticity is well from 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 my from my current understanding. So the thing is there is so that we have actually an overlay of different frequencies, right? So also it's random, but so we have then uh, some uh, spikes that are actually uh, ha having a fast frequency, as well as we have some larger gaps. So meaning that there probably, and so this is what we will try to to demonstrate in uh, within the next year or so, is that we can activate different pathways at the same time, right? So where if you would have an oscillatory pattern, so you would target one specific pathway or a subset of specific pathways where stochastic, uh, stochastic signatures can then play the whole piano, let's say it in that way. Increasing the octaves of your piano. So let's move on to the next question. Um, so from Rodrigo. Uh, great, uh, in the metabolic part, it seems that um, so it seems that the frequency of the experimental calcium oscillation was much lower than that in the stochastic simulation. Do you think that the stochastic models do yield the sigmoidal curve at such a low frequencies? Um, so we we have the so we have seen that in the in the simulations that uh, we can have this uh, sigmoidal behavior still there. So. But um, as, as you have seen also in the data spread, right, so then it becomes much more noisier. So, but in general, so it's also uh, visible in the pure stochastic behavior. Okay, thanks. We might just stop because uh, there's one more question, but it takes a bit long to read and answer, I guess. Sorry about that, uh, Rajan. Uh, yes, uh, but Alex can comment on that. Uh, during the next talk. Okay, uh, I think we should move on to the next talk by uh, Dingo To. Yeah, I would like to introduce um, Rudiger you... to you. I met Rudiger for the first time earlier this year when he traveled to Liverpool to give a talk at our departmental seminar. And uh, before the seminar, I was actually convinced that it was impossible to give a detailed talk about spatiotemporal calcium dynamics to an audience that didn't know anything about calcium dynamics before. Well, I have to say that Rüdiger showed that I was very wrong. Like our previous speaker, Rüdiger did his PhD with Martin Falke in 2004, I think, and after staying there for a brief postdoc, he moved to Nottingham where he has been ever since. He won a Leverholm early career fellowship and uh, currently he is an associate professor in applied mathematics in Nottingham. I'm looking forward to your talk, Rüdiger. Thank you very much for having me here today. And um, what I would like to talk to you about today are essentially two scales of calcium signaling, one at the subcellular scale and the other one at the whole cell spiking. So to begin with the subcellular scale, when you think of a normal cell, you can ask yourself the following questions. Where do vital calcium signals emerge in a cell and where do the molecular readouts for these calcium signals actually reside? 
Now, we already heard in the previous talks that there are specialized locations in the cell where this happens. For instance, we heard that there are uh, special contact sites between the endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria, such that calcium that is released through IP30 receptor channels on the ER membrane feed preferentially into the calcium signaling machinery of mitochondria. And so, in some instances, it might therefore be appropriate to think of a cell as a network of these so called signaling microdomains. Today, I would like to talk to you about a microdomain that's also present in neuronal spines, which goes by the name of store operated calcium entry, or SOC E, and it involves two molecular partners, ORI and STEM. Now, when your cell is at rest, then STEM, which is located in the ER membrane, shows a diffusive distribution, as you can see here on the top left image in right, in, in red, and this something similar is true for the crack channels, which are located in the plasma membrane. Again, at rest, they show a nice diffusive distribution, as you can see here. Now, when the calcium concentration in the ER drops, which, for instance, happens during repeated stimulation and calcium liberation from the ER, then STEM and ORI migrate to so-called ERPM junction and form puncta. You can see this down here, where in red you observe the puncta for STEM, in green you observe the puncta for ORI, and if you were to overlay these two images, then you would see a nice orange image showing strong localization of STEM and ORI. And once STEM and ORI are co-localized, essentially the ORI channel forms and calcium flows from the extracellular space through the ORI channels into the cytoplasm. And once it has arrived in the cytoplasm, then we have circuit pumps on the ER membrane that pump calcium into the ER, thus replenishing the ER. Now, the crucial point is that once the levels of calcium in the ER are high enough, then essentially STEM and ORI dissociate, the ORI channel stops conducting calcium, and the cell is ready again to release calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, what this little schematic shows to you is that this all happens locally. And to me, one of the nicest experiments that show that is the local calcium signature that is important for cellular dynamics and not a global calcium signaling comes from work of Annette Parag and Oxford from a couple of years back. So what they did is they took mast cells and simulated them with a compound called LCC4 in the presence of two millimolar extracellular calcium. And what they observed are these nice calcium oscillations, as we would expect. Fact. Now, the group also measured the expression of a transcription factor, namely CFOS, and you see this over here. And in light gray, you see that the level of CFOS expression is almost twice as high as the one in control condition, which is here shown in black. Now, the group repeated the experiment in zero extracellular calcium. And so, as you would expect, the calcium oscillations run out because essentially the cell runs out of calcium in the ER because the ER calcium cannot be replenished. And when we look at the expression of calcium, of the uh, transcription factor, again, we see that there's um, a transcription level factor that is comparable to the one that we have for resting conditions. But here comes the key experiment. This is done in zero extracellular calcium, but the cell is chemically insulated by the application of LA3+, which means that calcium cannot leave the cell. In this case, the calcium oscillations are just statistically indistinguishable from the one where we had two millimolar calcium in the extracellular space. However, when we look at the expression of CFOS, we see a marked decrease compared to 2 millimolar extracellular calcium. And this really shows to you that it is the local calcium signature in the ERPM microdomains that drives the downstream expression of CFOS and not the global cellular signature. And so this has really intrigued me. And what we've been working on for the last couple of years is to develop a modeling framework that allows us to answer these or to understand these ERPM junction much better. Now, one thing to bear in mind is that these ERPM junctions are really small. I mean, they're just 50 nanometers high on average and maybe two to 300 nanometers wide in diameter. So they are similar in size to the dyadic clefts that we heard of yesterday. Now, today, there is no current or there is no imaging technology that can actually resolve to a high spatial and temporal degree what goes on in these ER microdomains. And that's why we also developed 
uh, model. And we use this model to answer two particular questions that I want to talk to you about today. The first one is, does the positioning of all right channels and circuit pumps affect the RB filling? And what actually happens when we have two different isoforms for the circuit pumps? Now, our model is a 3D model for uh, ERPM microdomain in cylindrical geometry. And in total, we have four compartments. We have the ERPM junction. So that's the part of the cytosol that sits between the plus one membrane and the ER. Then we have the sub-PM ER, which is actually part of the ER that comes close to the plasma membrane. And in addition, we have the bulk cytoplasm and the bulk ER. Now, to begin with, we focused on the two core components, the ERPM junction and the sub-PM ER. Now, what is crucial for this model to work is that we get the fluxes right. And so for the ORI channel flux, we can start from the single channel current. Now, bear in mind that the single channel current for an ORI channel is just around two to five femtoamps. So that is really small. For instance, compare this to a typical L-type current that is like picoamps. So that is a thousand times smaller for the ORI channel to an L-type channel. So if you think of an L-type channel to deliver some sort of torrent of calcium into the cell, an ORI channel would be more like a small trickle coming in. For the circuit pumps, we use the bidirectional model that fields both the junctional calcium concentration Cj and the luminal calcium concentration Cs, so potentially allowing us a reverse flux of the circuit pumps. Now we can take those ingredients, the geometry and the fluxes, and put them into our 3D model. And here I just show the equations for the uh, ERPM junction. So we have in the volume pure diffusion, and then all the nonlinear dynamics actually happens on the boundary through localized, highly nonlinear boundary conditions. So the first question that we wanted to answer is whether it makes any difference whether all right channels are clustered or not. So we have two different configurations here shown schematically on the left hand side. We put the all right channels on a circle with a radius of 30 nanometers and then the circuit pumps on a circle of 60 nanometers. Now this schematic illustrates that or it might suggest that the circuit and the oil channel sit in the same plane, but they are not think that there is a difference of 50 nanometers in height between these two rings. And in the non-clustered configuration, we essentially have the same topology, but now the radius for the ORI channels is 50 nanometers and for the circuit pumps is 80 nanometers, so we keep the 30 nanometer dis distance. When we look at the calcium concentration profile at the plasma membrane, we observe little difference between the clustered and the non-clustered configuration. So you can clearly see the high calcium concentrations at the mouth of the channels. Note that here the calcium concentration can go up to 60 micromolar. And then for the clustered configuration, we have this fusion of the single channel nano domains to give us this elevated region in the center of the circle. For the Non-clustered configuration, this is absent, but again, we see these high calcium concentrations at the single channel cluster mouth. Now we see much more of a difference at the calcium concentration at the ER membrane. So for the cluster configuration, we have this region of elevated calcium in the center, and you can hardly discern the contributions from the individual or right channels. This is different to the non-clustered configuration where you can see these you know, red, yellow circles which um, show you where essentially the ORI channels sit in the uh, plasma membrane. We can quantify this behavior by just taking cuts along these dashed lines. And so here you see the results for the clustered channel in blue and for the non-clustered channel in red. So what is encouraging is that the peak concentrations doesn't really change much going from the cluster to the non-cluster configuration. And here you really have this quantification of the plateau that I showed to you on the previous slide that comes from the fusion of the single channel nano domains. On the ER membrane, we have this stark difference between the non-clustered and the clustered configuration. And what I should point out is that these little kinks that you see are no numerical artifacts. These are actually the circuit pumps taking out the calcium from the cytoplasm. Now, when we saw this, we thought, well, that's great. That's a clear cut story. So there is more calcium from the clustered configuration. So the circuit pumps get more calcium, hence the refilling for the ER should be better for the cluster than for the non-clustered configuration. 
but lo and behold, this was actually not the case. So here I show you cuts through the ER, but at fixed radius. So essentially we've taken cut along a cylinder like here and then unrolled the cylinder. And when you compare the left figure to the right figure, so the cluster to the non-clustered configuration, they pretty much look the same. So we have the same high concentration. The only difference that you might spot is that here this band of light blue is connected, while over here it's essentially chopped up. But that is a geometric effect. Because for the non-clustered configuration, the circuit pumps are simply further apart, so their nanodomains don't have a chance to fuse as we have for the clustered configuration. Now, we can perfectly understand that behavior when we look at the circuit pump activity expressed as calcium ions per second as a function of the ambient calcium concentration. Now, the cross denotes the calcium concentration for the clustered configuration and the asterisk for the non-clustered configuration. And you can see that in both cases, the circuit pumps are essentially maxed out. And that's why we don't see any difference. So the higher calcium concentration that we get for the clustered configuration actually doesn't have an impact because we are already maxed out at the non-clustered configuration. And then we thought, okay, if this doesn't work, so what happens if we move the circuit pumps further away from the origins because we know that the calcium concentration profiles drop off really quickly. Now we did this for the clustered and the non-clustered configuration. And here I just show you results for the clustered ones. And again, there isn't much difference. And so we can conclude that for circa 2B pumps, the difference between override channels and circuit pumps is not a major determinant for ER refilling. However, when we changed the circa to subtype to a 2A, we saw a marked difference. So here for 30 nanometer separation, we got more of an influx than for 60 nanometers. And again, we can understand this when we look at the response curve. So here, the black is not a response curve for the circa 2A. And bear in mind that the circa 2A is um, low affinity, but a high capacity curve, meaning it has a high KD and a high max rate compared to the Zerka 2B pump, which is a high affinity, but a low capacity pump. So it has a low KD, but a higher uh, and a low, sorry, um, maximal rate. Now at this point, you could have asked, well, Rudiger, couldn't you have guessed these results because you know these curves? But the answer is no, because while I know these curves, I wouldn't have known where to put the cross and the circle on these curves. So that's the power of our modeling approach. It actually gives us a quantitative readout of the calcium concentration in these signaling microdomains. And now we can see that for the circuit to A, when we double the distance, essentially the calcium concentration drops so much that the pump rate is almost half. And that's the reason why for the circuit to A pumps, distance matters, but for the circuit to B pumps, it actually doesn't. And now when we have a closer look at the calcium concentration in the um, uh, ERPM junction, then we can see that the interplay between ori channels and circuit pumps really leads to a micro patterning of the calcium concentration. So here on the top left, you see the calcium concentration at fixed radius through a ring where the ori channels live. And we observe these nice tongs coming in from the um, ORI channels. Now for the circuit pumps, or for the location where the circuit pumps are, we also see these tongs coming in. But mind, there, you, there is this radial offset between circuit pumps and ORI channels. And that's why these red tongs that you see here are just the remnants of the um, lobes coming in from the ORI channels. Now the behavior for the non-cluster configuration is very similar. But what I would like to draw your attention to are the gradients in the calcium concentration. And I found this really intriguing because these gradients might actually endow cells with a dynamic mechanism to differentially activate downstream effectors. So suppose you have two downstream effectors with different affinities, so different KDs. Depending on where they are positioned within the microdomains, cells could differentially activate them. And so to me, these ERPM jumps are not just some homeostatic element of a cell that allows the ER to be refilled again and so that calcium oscillations can continue, but it's an active compartment for differentially activating downstream effectors of cellular signaling.
And on that note, I would like to move on to the second part of my talk and now completely switch scales and go from the microscopic domain to the whole cell calcium spikes. Now, as Alexander has nicely introduced, calcium spikes are truly stochastic and heterogeneous. And here, I just want to give you two more examples for that. So these are HEC293 cells stimulated with carbocol in a step change experiment. And you can see that when the solution is exchanged, we get an increase in spike frequency, which is the well-known uh, frequency encoding of calcium oscillations. Now, we looked at quite a lot of data, and so here we just plot the raster plot for these cells, and what you can clearly see is that there is a lot of heterogeneity and stochasticity in these calcium spikes. And so for a few years now, we've been working on a statistical framework that allows us to quantify these stochastic calcium spikes at the whole cell level. And there are two main reasons for doing that. The first one is we would like to get a handle on the cellular heterogeneity. So I think that we want to understand calcium dynamics in a tissue with all these different cells. And so the question is, is there a common theme to calcium spiking or are these cells really very heterogeneous? And if they are, are there any clusters that we can see? So what are the structural properties of the cells in terms of their calcium spiking behavior? The second aspect is that we can learn something for um, the subcellular processes by looking at the whole cell calcium spiking, and I will illustrate that in a minute. Now it turns out that for the machinery that we use, which is essentially Bayesian inference, stochastic point processes, and some Markov chain Monte Carlo, that there are two ingredients that you need to know. So one is the interspike interval distribution, so the IC distribution, and the other one is the intensity function. Now, the IC distribution just measures how likely it is that two spikes are separated by a certain amount of time. And the intensity function gives you a handle on the spiking behavior in the long term. So if you've never heard anything about an intensity function, you can think of it as the average spike rate of a cell. So if you had a chance to take a cell and let's say stimulate it with the identical stimulus 100 times and measure the spikes and then look at the mean spike rate, that would be your intensity function. So what we have set up over the last couple of years is a pipeline that allows us to start from fluorescent signals, as you see here at the top, and then derive the intensity functions. So when we have data that is so nice and clean, like here, we can just threshold the spikes to get the spike times out, or we can also do some more sophisticated data analysis. And then from that, we can use our Bayesian approach to get the intensity function. Now, because we have a Bayesian methodology, we not only get the mean intensity function, which is here shown as the black solid line, but also its 95% confidence interval, which tells us how good the estimate actually is. And so to get a feel for what this intensity function represents, observe that at the beginning of the experiment, the cell spikes quite quickly, so the intensity function goes up. And then in the middle regime, the cell sets into some sort of stationary spiking, which is reflected in this flat line of the intensity function. Then at uh, solution exchange, we get an increase in the spike frequency, so an increase in the intensity function, and then as the intensity function drops up, this is mirrored by a petering off of the calcium spikes. And now we can do this for all the data that we have and look at the mean intensity functions as shown in panel D down here. And the question now is, and I will talk about this in a minute, is are there any clusters in there? What can we learn about the structural heterogeneity in these intensity functions? But I also mentioned on the previous slides that we need to have an IC distribution. Now, a priori, it's really hard to know what IC distribution we should use. So we tested different ones. So in blue, you see results from a Poisson distribution, in red from an inverse Gaussian distribution, and in gray from a uh, gamma distribution. And so to cut a long story short, we can run two tests. One is called a kolmogorov smirnov test, and the other one is called a quantile-quantile test to ascertain which probability distribution is most consistent with the data. And essentially, if all these data points here line up on a 45 degree line, then we know that that probability distribution is most consistent. And as you can see, this is true for the gamma distribution, both for the kolmogorov smirnov and the quantile quantile. So this gives us some confidence that the uh, gamma distribution might actually be a really good candidate for the IC distribution. 
Now, importantly, we did this for two data sets from two different labs, and it all came back with the gamma distribution. And that was something that we were really excited about, because as I said earlier, we can link these whole cell IC distribution to subcellular processes. And here it's worth bearing in mind that the gamma distribution is the first passage time distribution for n events to occur for the first time. Now that is consistent with some ideas of how calcium spikes occur, namely through the orchestrated action of individual calcium parts. So if parts come together, to that then trigger a calcium spike, and that would be consistent with the gamma distribution as an IC. Now, the great thing is we can now quantify what I showed you here by looking at the slopes for individual cells. And these box box illustrate really that for the gamma distribution, we get slopes that are around one, look that the medium is almost close to one, and that the gamma distribution has a much less spread compared to the lines that we get for the Poisson distribution and the inverse Gaussian distribution. And here for these, we clearly see that the mean is further away from one. Now, I already said that we can use these intensity functions to look more at the spiking regime, and I mentioned a stationary spiking regime, and that is where the intensity function is essentially flat. And so what we did is for the cell here on the left, we could work out the interspike interval distribution, and because the intensity function is more or less flat, this is the IC distribution for this entire spike interval. The red curve that you see is the IC distribution for the cell here on the right, where we have this flat bit here towards the beginning of this experiment. Now, I hope you can see this, that the cell on the left spikes more than the cell on the right, and so we would expect that the IC distribution has shifted towards the left, and that is exactly what we see. Also, you can see that the mean spiking rate is around 100 to 150 seconds, which is consistent with what we would see in experiments. But there's another observation that I want to make. Rodigan, um, oh, sorry, yeah? you have five minutes. Oh, that's fine, I'll finish. Thank you. And so we can also then make contact, for instance, to refractory periods by seeing that nothing happens at the beginning of the IC distribution. And so what we want to do then is also to cluster the intensity function, as I said earlier. And in the past, we used like um, principal component analysis and k-means, but here we used Haar wavelets. And what this gives us is essentially a piecewise constant representation of the intensity function. And so all we need to do now is essentially look at the coefficients and the magnitudes of these piecewise constant approximations. And here I just show you a result of this. So these are step intensity functions from step change experiments. And on the left, you see clustering based on the sign of the um, coefficients on the hard wavelets. And essentially, for instance, when they all have positive signs, we know that we have a decrease. And what this matrix representation actually tells you is what features we see. For instance, at the beginning of the experiment, some cells show a bump in their spike rate, but the majority of cells just has a decrease in their spiking behavior. And then we get another bump when we apply the second stimulus. Now, we've chosen a presentation like this because it allows us to cluster on whatever properties we want. So it's very flexible. Some of you might cluster on features at a certain time point. Others want to cluster on the overall features. And this representation allows you to do this. And the same is true when we look at the magnitude of the features. And again, we see here that the features are more pronounced at the beginning of the experiment than at the step change at the end. And with this, I would like to conclude my talk. So in the first part, I showed you some results for our work on sim oral microdomains, and that the interplay between oral channels and circuit pumps actually sh shapes the microsignature in these domains. And we find this really exciting because, as I said, this allows cells to really dynamically uh, activate different downstream effectors. We also saw that the clustering of our channels does not enhance ER referring contrary to what we might have expected. And crucially, there's a difference in circa two isoforms in terms of refilling. The second part of my talk then looked at whole cell calcium spiking. And 
we employed a Bayesian approach to look at non-Markovian constant spikes. So you can use this framework, and we did that in the past, to look at time-dependent simulations, which is physiologically more realistic than the step changes or constant simulations that are typically used in experiments. And what our Bayesian analysis showed is that the gamma distribution is most consistent with the beta, which is really encouraging because that links into the idea of calcium puffs coming together to give you a calcium spike. And the last part showed that we can use a hard decomposition to actually decompose the intensity functions and we found a rich feature space and this allows us to really start separating these uh, intensity functions even further. And with this, I would like to thank my collaborators. So with Steve, I've been working for a long time on modeling calcium dynamics, and we did the work on the calcium microdomains together with Emma. And with Theo, I've been working on estimating the intensity functions. Jake is the current PhD student on the project, but I also would like to thank Agne Tilonaito, who spoke yesterday, who did substantial work on these intensity functions. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Thanks a lot, uh, Rüdiger. That was a really nice talk. Um, I have two questions from the audience for you. Mm -hmm. So um, the first question is from James Sneed. So he uh, says, lovely stuff as always, Rüdiger. You concentrated mm -hmm. on how spatial effects affect ER refilling. But we know that calcium influx affects a number of things directly. PLC and PKC spring to mind immediately, and FAT2, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Surely these are unlikely to be an effect of ER refilling. Ah, oh, you just answered my question during the talk. Never mind, I see. So <laughs> it seems that he is apparently happy with what you said, but uh, would you like to say anything else? Um, yeah, so it's actually, so for instance, you mentioned the PLC. I think they're actually separated, they're located outside those microdomains. And so it's here not just an issue of ER refilling, but the point that I wanted to make is that, for instance, downstream effectors can be activated in these microdomains and then they can travel from these microdomains to other locations in the cell and then uh, trigger release, they also trigger dynamics there. Mm -hmm. So there's another uh, question from Audrey, Audrey Deniso. Very interesting talk. Did you test the effect of buffering concentrations of buffers on your results? That is a really good question because um, we could have included buffers in the ERPM junctions. Now, I had long discussions with Anand about this and he claims that because the calcium concentrations are so high, buffers would essentially saturate very, very quickly and that then would essentially integrate out the buffer dynamics. Now, it is something that we still want to test, which we haven't done yet. So it's on our to-do list, but that's a really good point about buffers. Thanks. And I see a third question by Alexei Braje, who talked uh, yesterday. Um, so he says, uh, thanks for the great talk. Are you using hard decomposition in several time scales? Yes, absolutely. So we essentially go down to three or four time scales. And um, actually, no, I can't share my slides anymore. Um, what, what you saw is that step function had essentially 16 pieces. So we started out at the largest Haar wavelet, which is essentially just a constant. Then the second time scale, yeah, we do this on different time scales. And depending on the signal, we can go down to a higher spatial resolution and see whether we can detect more features. And essentially, if you want to get high resolution for some more small scale features, we would need to go higher Haar wavelets. But the great thing is the framework is very, very flexible. And computationally, it's very cheap. So you, you tell me what uh, spatial scale you would like, and we can easily run the hard wavelets at that resolution. Well, thank you very much. I don't see any more questions from the audience. So if you want to ask more questions, you can do this on Neurostars. Uh, we have a bit of a break until our next uh, session that starts in, um, yeah, not half an hour, but a bit less. Um, it will be uh, Martin Falke um, and two of the workshop organizers. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will have a bit of a break. Um, see you after the break. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot.
So good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or, or good evening, depending on the game where you're joining in. Uh, this is Maurizio De Pita uh, from the Basque Center of Applied Mathematics, temporarily relocated on a comfortable sofa in a private residence somewhere in one of the main headquarters of the Bilbao city. Um, I am very pleased to introduce uh, our uh, first speaker of our second session for today's uh, workshop, who is Martin Hawkey from the Max Delbruck uh, uh, Research Center for Molecular Medicine in Berlin. Um, I would like to give uh, some perhaps an informal introduction about uh, who is about to speak. So I know Martin by now uh, from his work uh, around 15 years and in person about I guess 10 years, I was counting it uh, this morning. Uh, the first, uh, and I think the only, no, no, not the only one. The first time I visited Martin was uh, in uh, January 2011, when I was um, actually coming from uh, my first week of parting in Berlin. So I was probably not in the best conditions uh, to, to meet uh, one of the most prominent scientists uh, in uh, one of the topics I, I was researching yet. But Martin was very um, condescending and very uh, paternal in that sense, in as much as they had a major uh, talk that day. Nevertheless, uh, he, he stayed uh, to listen to my talk, which by then I was a little bit uh, less experienced than what I could do now. And it was very nice, and he stayed there for three hours listening to stuff that for me was apparently exotic, but for him, it was just fact it was not. And in that nice uh, meeting we had, it was him, Alex Kupin, that you listened just before, that he was uh, doing his uh, postdoc there. And another guy that unfortunately is not able to join us today was Kevin Turley, who right now became a PI at the Center for Research in Inflammation in Berlin. So what can I say about Martin? Martin is, along with uh, James, uh, probably, uh, earlier this morning, and I don't know if James is listening, is one of uh, the big olds of uh, the calcium signaling uh, research by now. We are very lucky to have uh, James today and, uh, and Martin. So um, both of them are master of many uh, skills and probably fathers of some well and so martin as it's hard to uh, not like to mention all the contributions that martin has, has given to the calcium field uh, in the past i guess 30 years or so he has been searching on this and uh, uh, besides the different molecular pathways um, uh, probably to martin we owe the, the really the consolidation and uh, the start of a new field uh, back uh, more or less 10, 15 years ago, which is the uh, analysis and study and the mathematical basis for the stochastic calcium signaling. And uh, without further hesitation, uh, I would like to just uh, share now the presentation by Martin. So we had some technical uh, issues with the setup. So we have a pre-recorded uh, uh, talk and I'm gonna share it uh, with you right now. And uh, uh, Martin will be, of course, available and live at the end of the talk to address the question. So thank you, Martin, and uh, we are gonna share your, your, your work. Welcome to my talk. My name is Martin Falke, and I talk about modeling concept concepts for IP3 induced calcium signaling. IP3 induced calcium spiking generates calcium concentration spike sequences in response to stimulation with an extracellular agonist. Here we see sequences from five different cell types. The upper panel shows the average cellular calcium concentration, the lower panel, the sequences of interspike intervals. On the right hand side, we see two examples from hepatocytes without the intervals. The sequences of spike times and interspike intervals are very irregular or even random in all examples. 
we can quantify the randomness by the relation between the standard deviation and the average in the spike interval. Here, each dot corresponds to the spike sequence from one cell in a multicellular experiment. We see that all cell types with all stimulations exhibit a linear relation between the average interspike interval and the standard deviation. This linear relation is shown in the upper right. The ST, the standard deviation, is equal to alpha times the average minus the absolute refractory period. The slope of this relation tells us how much of the regulated part of the interspike interval is random. In spontaneously spiking cells, it is close to 100%. In hepatocytes stimulated with vasopressin, it is still about 20%. Cell-to-cell -cell variability is large. Here we see box plots illustrating the outcome of 18 experiments with hex cells and 11 experiments with hepatocytes. Each experiment comprised between 17 and 65 cells. The scatter of the average interspike interval of the individual cells illustrated by box plots is large. So even with a time average of the interspike interval, we find large to say, we find large say to say variability on top of the temporal variability. Now we look at the population average of the time average of the individual cells. It obeys an exponential dependency on the agonist concentration stimulating the cell with all pathways tested so far. Since we find the single exponential only in the population average, all cells contributing to the average have the same exponential. The value of beta is specific for cell types and pathways, but not subject to cell variability. So the general problems we are finding are interspike intervals are random, cell to cell variability is very large, the agonist concentration response relation of the average interspike interval is exponential, and the moment relation and the agonist sensitivity beta are cell type and pathway specific and not subject to cell variability. And these properties are general in the sense that they have been found in all experiments testing them and more than one cell type. IP3 induced calcium signaling exhibits this, this structural hierarchy. The IP3 receptor channel molecules form clusters and these clusters are scattered throughout the cell. Each structure level has its typical time scale, milliseconds for the channel, 10 to 100 milliseconds for the cluster, and 10 to, 100 of, uh, to hundreds of seconds on cell level. The task of theory is to predict behavior from the parameters of the system. And a typical Property of the system is a propagation of the molecular noise across the structure levels up to the cell level. The molecular level can be described by channel state schemes, which define Markov chains and stochastic simulations or master equations. The cluster level adds diffusion of calcium and calcium binding molecules, and the cell level may add pathways responding to cell average values. So how can I reach theory of this system? I start with the first step. And the first step is deriving rate equations from the master equation. I do this with a model of ordinary differential equations as a final goal in mind, which is supposed to explain the spike time. So the random event on this level is the spike time. Deriving rate equations from a master equation leads to a hierarchy of moment equations if the coefficient matrix depends on the state variables, which usually is the case. This hierarchy of moment equations can be reduced to the first moment if all higher moments are very small 
That is the case if I consider large ensembles of stochastic elements. If the distribution is sharply peaked, you can derive rate equations for the first moment. And these rate equations are then the deterministic limit of the dynamics. Let's look at the classic example of random events, radioactive decay. The decay event has a probability per unit time lambda. P of t is a probability that decay happens at time t. If lambda is small, it may take a very long time till the atom decays. What happens if the atom uh, what happens with the atom during that time? Nothing, 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 and bam, it decays. The state of the atom is constant before the decay event. There is no process leading to the event, and therefore the event time is random. The same applies to random spiking of a single cell with constant spike probability. There is no process leading to that spike, and the spike time is random. I'll comment later on varying spike probability. Event timing changes if you look at the decay of many atoms. The event is now seeing n atoms still existing. The time of n atoms still existing is well defined and its distribution is sharply peaked. This is so because a microscopic process leads to that event. The process is a change of the number of atoms due to radioactive decay. If I want precise timing, I need a macroscopic process. The converse is not true. You do not get precise timing whenever you have a macroscopic process. How can we transfer this to calcium spiking? We can consider many cells and the probability that n of them produced a spike. The macroscopic process is that the number of cells having spike changes due to spiking. Then we get a precise time for the event n cells have spiked. So the most deterministic models are developed in order to describe the behavior of single cells. Deterministic models want the spike of a single cell to occur at a specific interspike interval TM. So I need a microscopic process to make the average precise. I can average over many channels. Fine. Unfortunately, in many cases, t average is much longer than any time scale of the state dynamics or even the cellular dynamics. If the interspike interval is set by a small probability and not a slow process, its time scale will not show up in the deterministic equation for a single cell. So, in many cases, if I want to get the time scale right in a single cell model, I need to invent a slow process or just decrease the rate of the state scheme by one or two orders of magnitude or something like that. So how serious is this a problem of applying the deterministic limit to single cells? We can assess the contribution of processes to setting the spike time from the moment relation. The moment relation of different cell types and pathways has different slopes. As I said before, these slopes indicate the contribution of processes to fixing the spike time. So if the slope is close to 1, there is no process setting the spike time. The spike time is completely random. If the slope is much smaller than 1, there is a process affecting spike timing. However, we learn from the experiments that the standard deviation of timing is still above 20% of the average. Also, the average is not simply the inverse of the rate of this process, but rather shows a polar dependency uh, like this one shown here, 
and this is explained in the publication below. So now I consider the next step uh, to, of developing an OD model. This is the spatial averaging. That means I delete the diffusion terms and average the source terms. IP3 receptor channel clusters are spatially discrete objects. Their spatial separation is larger than their diameter. Here you see a few examples. In the upper right panel, the distance in micrometers is given by the red numbers. The ratio of cluster distance to diameter is 4 to 10, and hence the ratio of total volume to calcium flux source volume is 64 to 1000. That ratio scales our expectations towards concentration regions. Local concentration at open channels or clusters cannot be directly measured. We can only simulate them. Here you see the result of 3D simulations with a realistic channel count below 0.1 picometer. The spatially average concentrations measured in cells are one to two orders of magnitude smaller than the local concentrations at open channels. Hence, we deal with substantial gradients inside cells. For the dynamic behavior, it is more important that local concentrations are one order of magnitude larger than the dynamic range of the calcium regulation of the IP3 receptor channels. Here you see the measured calcium dependency of the transition rates of an IP3 receptor channel. All of them have essentially saturated at 5 micromolar. The calcium binding sites on the IP3 receptor see the local concentrations. Hence, if the channel is open, sees concentrations much larger than the spatial average and much larger than its dynamic range. What does this mean for models? Here you see on the left hand side the behavior of the de kaiser model simulated with spatially averaged concentrations. It shows nice oscillations within a range of IP3 concentrations of about 0.2 micromolar. On the right hand side you see the same model analyzed with realistic local concentrations. Oscillations are essentially gone, except an IP3 concentration, concentration range of less than 10 nanomolar. In the lower row, you see that these oscillations have an amplitude of about one micromolar at the channel itself, but the spatially average global oscillations are the nanomolar range. So they are completing language. Okay, so finally, let's look at the concept local dynamics is equal to global dynamics, which follows from spatial average. We can reduce the cluster cluster coupling by calcium diffusion by loading EGTA into cells. Then we can observe the local dynamics which is a cluster behavior directly. We can see cluster behavior also with stronger simulations. The clusters produce sequences of puffs, short random calcium release events. Puffs become more frequent with increasing stimulation. Do these sequences exhibit any sign of periodicity? We can check the interpuff interval return if the sequence of interpuff intervals is periodic, this map should look like a loop with a hole in the center. As you can see, the measured interpuff interval sequences do not exhibit such a hole, but look rather random. A more direct comparison is shown here. Without EGTA, we see spiking, but with EGTA, we do not see any indication of the spike period or cluster number. Hence, experimental support for local oscillatory dynamics could not be found. That is also agrees with studies on isolated IP3 receptors, neither showing any long time scales, and it also agrees with our modeling studies with realistic local concentration. 
So we find there are serious problems with higher moments and time scales in the first step. Gradients seen in connection with the dynamic range of mega channel state schemes actually do not allow for spatial averaging. And for the resulting concept, local dynamics equals global dynamics, we lack experimental evidence supporting it. So how did we get into this mess and how do we get out of it? The most important question you have to ask yourself when you start modeling is to which mathematical structure does IP3 induce calcium signaling correspond? The answer to that question determines mathematical tools to be used for model development. The model, uh, the answer I have used so far was the mathematical structure of IP3 induced calcium signaling corresponds to a set of deterministic nonlinear rate equations. So that got us into this mess, that mess. Let's try another answer. The mathematical structure corresponding to IP3 induced calcium signaling is an array of noisy, excitable, maybe bistable elements coupled by a diffusion process. There is strong coupling within clusters and weak coupling between clusters. Global feedbacks and processes set long time scales. Note that this answer does not mean that you cannot derive deterministic equations as an approximation to their dynamics. It simply looks your starting point as different and rate equations probably also look different. So that depends on the purpose of your modeling. Our first purposes of model development are calculate moments of the interspike interval distributions, what determines the average interspike interval, and why is the moment relation so robust. The general theory I will present has been published in this uh, paper here application to calcium spiking is work in progress and I will present first qualitative results. So our array of stochastic excitable elements uh, are the clusters and the puff dynamics and we will go up to cell dynamics. Here you see this paradigmatic movie from Ian Parker's lab on spike generation by wave nucleations. Puffs cooperate by calcium induced cultural release to set off the body. We radically simplify the spike generation process to the dynamics of the number of open clusters up to the critical number and critical causing a global spike. The process starts from no open clusters and goes forth and back, and once it reaches a critical, it generates a spike. We will consider the dynamics of reaching a critical after a previous spike. The waiting time distributions for increasing the number of open channels are the interpath interval distributions. The waiting time distributions for decreasing that numbers are the path duration distributions. The interpath interval distributions can be measured directly and fit by double exponentials. Here we see examples from SH, SY, FIFA, and hexons. The channel state dynamics as well as the local calcium concentration dynamics is already included in these distributions. We do not need to formulate them separately anymore. How do long time scales and global processes enter? A global release by causes negative inhibitory feedback that might be store depletion or negative feedback to the IP3 production rate or uh, other processes. That terminates the spike. Afterwards, the cell slowly recovers from that negative feedback. That means the buff probability is zero just after the spike and then slowly recovers. Consequently, right after a spike, 
the cluster opening probability is zero. The stochastic process can go to the left only. Whereas the recovery from negative feedback, the open probability increases and the process can also go to the right. So the right going weighted time distributions are zero in the beginning, just after the previous spike and fast later on. The left going weighted time distribution slightly adapt, but merely by normalization. Calcium induced calcium release adds a positive feedback and spatial coupling to the stochastic process. It increases the open probability with an increasing number of uh, open channels. So the more clusters are open, the faster remaining ones open to. So now we can calculate the Laplace, trans Laplace transform of the probability fluxes analytically. I would only like to mention that this is possible, but not to want to explain solving the difference equation as shown here. That is explained in detail in the publication down here. We can obtain the moments of the interspike interval distribution directly from the Laplace transforms of the probability fluxes. So how do the robustness properties of alpha relate to our stochastic systems? Details uh, or alpha is robust against details of spatial cluster arrangement and changes of effective diffusion coefficients as has been shown in the experiments. So that means it is robust against uh, details of uh, positive feedback and the length of the chain, the number of, uh, the critical number of paths which have to occur before a spike. And it is also robust against sense of uh, stimulation, and this is a factor multiplying all right going waiting time distribution. So here we see qualitative results for alpha with lower recovery from negative feedback, but without calcium induced calcium release. So alpha decreases with a decreasing rate of recovery from negative feedback, and that agrees with robustness characteristics since recovery from global feedback is a cell average process covers the range of mega values. And alpha is minimal at the resonant uh, chain lengths. So this is interesting on its own, but it is not what we are looking for. We are looking for robustness against a change in a critical. So slow recovery from negative feedback plus calcium induced calcium release actually provides the robustness of alpha we are looking for. So alpha then becomes robust uh, for a critical values above about five and against uh, details of the positive feedback as you see here changed by the exponent in the positive feedback. And we also get the long time scales on a global level, despite having only fast local dynamics. I conclude the mathematical structure corresponding to IP3 induced calcium signaling is an array of coupled noisy excitable elements. Global feedbacks set long time scales. Starting from there, we find the relation between SD and average of interspike intervals, its robustness properties, long time scales with fast local dynamics, and we find that long time scales often arise from small probabilities and do not require slow processes. That requirement is an artifact of applying deterministic models to signal cells.
we find that instead slow recovery from negative feedback is required for small values of alpha. Thank you for listening. Okay, so I will start uh, myself uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the first question while uh, the others are populating uh, the Ask a Question session. So <clears throat> I would like to ask you, Martin, if uh, we have uh, some insights really on what are the sources, the sources for such for stochasticity. Such stochasticity. Now, this is directly the uh, channel state noise. So the channel state noise it turns into a uh, shot-like uh, concentration noise. So local amplitudes are very large, uh, and this is why you cannot average them out. Uh, so you obtain out of channel state noise, shot-like concentration noise, and shot noise has a tendency to propagate up. Because in uh, the amplitude does not uh, decrease if you go to larger cells, the amplitude of the noise. So concerning instead the, um, the formulation that you, you present, which goes back to seminal work by, by you with Kevin and now uh, with, uh, with uh, Friedloff, I think, Friedloff, right? So is the same model and the master equation be still extendable uh, in the case in which I, I assume I have uh, a spatially uh, variable lambda or a spatially variable sigma. So the uh, the analytical solution we presented for the uh, probability fluxes uh, is very general. So uh, you can, it is uh, almost, uh, or is it valid for almost arbitrary uh, waiting time distributions? The only condition is you need to be able to Laplace transform them. But this applies to a very general class of functions. Uh, uh, and then you can, uh, you can put a very different processes into the waiting time distributions. So you can render your waiting time distributions dependent on the number of open channels. Uh, you can uh, render them uh, to some limit uh, time dependent, at least wear time uh, dependent, uh, as you please. And then uh, as a second uh, degree of freedom, you have this slow relaxation process. This uh, has to be exponential. It could maybe also uh, generalize to two exponentials, but as long as you have exponentials there, uh, this uh, solution works. So this is pretty generally applicable. Thanks, as Thanks, I, I, as I actually, as I actually did did spoke. So, so we have a couple, have of, a couple of questions. Two questions. I'll start with I'll start uh, with question by Alexei Grasse, that's uh, speaking yesterday, from, yesterday Moscow. from Moscow. So Alexei is, so actually, Alexei asking is actually asking if, if uh, generalizing the fire model, model, model for adaptive international international fire model, fire model could also be could also used, be uh, used uh, uh, to, to, uh, to account for account kind of kind of of fighting or if there is something similar, similar in the, in the, uh, in the uh, panorama. panorama. So this is actually uh, uh, close to the uh, uh, integrate and fire models. Yeah, so uh, there, is, there is close relation or uh, between uh, the uh, stochastic formulation of spike generation and uh, integrate and fire models. Yeah. So usually integrate and fire models uh, do not have this uh, slow uh, relaxation uh, time scale, but otherwise they are pretty close. And actually we are working on, uh, on an application of integrate and fire models to cut some dynamics. Okay thank, okay, you. thank you. Then Evo Sigma, who is going to make up for you, uh, is, uh, asking, is actually, asking actually... Right, if right. the model if that, the model uh, that, that uh, you could also be used in the context of other cells, other cells, especially when especially we take into consideration, consideration 
refractory period. For example, for example, thinking about neural dynamics. Uh, now it can be used to uh, any system uh, showing something like a threshold phenomenon. Yeah, so whenever uh, either you have such a threshold like the critical number of stochastic elements which needs to be active, or you could also choose uh, this number uh, uh, to be the total number uh, of, uh, of elements and then uh, it is essentially a random walk uh, on a linear chain and it is a non-Markovian formulation. So this uh, liberates us uh, from uh, the necessity to include all the microscopic uh, detail uh, in, into that uh, formulation. And this can be applied to a large class of, uh, uh, of processes for, for instance, also working of uh, of uh, molecules on DNA or things like that. Thanks a lot for Thanks your, a lot answer. For your <laughs> answer. Okay, and last okay, question, and last question uh, uh, from, Alex, uh, from Alex, who is running, who is between, running uh, between uh, distort and simulation of COVID. Uh, uh, so, so would you be able, you to, be say able to say something about something the length of, of the vessels that you observe in the world and the flow that you shot in the process? Sorry, I, I did not get I'm saying, uh, I'm uh, saying, uh, you would be able. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying if you be able, you would be able to something, say something. Uh, uh, I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. sorry. I, I, I'm saying, I'm Alex, saying the Alex is the Alex yeah. is the length uh, of the length 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 of the uh, the relaxation rate, the longer is uh, this uh, uh, this resonant chain. I, I think we uh, found uh, a polar power law dependency uh, there and uh, so it looks in, or if you include a positive feedback, uh, the the range where we see this minimal uh, uh, coefficient of variation uh, becomes much broader. So we can actually uh, assume that uh, calcium spiking, stimulated calcium spiking is within uh, this resonant uh, range of the length uh, of uh, the linear chain and calcium induced calcium release expands uh, this range of uh, of the resonance phenomenon to a broad range. Okay. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, much Martin. Martin. And, uh, and uh, while, uh, while uh, Martin, if, Martin, if there are other sorry. Yes. Very good. Uh, so before I introduce you, one second. Uh, yeah, we had the chance to, to speak the two of us quite often in the past three days. So I guess you know each other pretty well by now. Yeah. So uh, everyone who is joining in right now, uh, we are bearing a delay of about 25 minutes due to some technical issues with the previous talk. So please, if you look at the program of this workshop, just to consider that we have uh, we are starting now with the second talk by Ivo Sigmund. So um, let me give you a brief introduction about Ivo. So Ivo uh, got uh, for first uh, uh, his degrees in uh, Osnabrück in Germany uh, in mathematics and applied system science. Then uh, he did his uh, PhD with Horst uh, Malkov and Osnabrück on modeling viral infections and plankton. 
then uh, start working on calcium channels and moving to Auckland at the Bioengineering Institute over there for a postdoc with uh, Edmund Campin that uh, right now is in uh, moved to to Melbourne, right? I believe. Uh, yes, yes, he moved to Melbourne. Right. And uh, James Knight uh, uh, that uh, we saw this morning. You see, it's really nice. We have essentially different children today in these first two sessions by the two fathers uh, that we had the pleasure to host so far. Sorry, Martin. Sorry, James. I don't know if you are listening. It's nothing uh, insulting. It's actually a much uh, a big congratulations. So, um, anyways, after that, Ivo worked uh, in the new systems uh, biology lab uh, with Edmund Crampin again, that we know why we moved to Melbourne. He returned briefly to Germany to work with Alan Smoot at the Max Planck Institute of Biological Chemistry and the Institute of Mathematical Stochastics in Göttingen. And then since 2017, he, he took over a position as a senior lecturer of applied mathematics at, uh, John, at Liverpool John Moore University in the UK. And right now he's enjoying his uh, good time inside uh, the house due to the pandemics. And um, and uh, nothing else. Uh, with that in mind, uh, I will say that I leave the stage to Ivo. And uh, please go ahead, and uh, we'll uh, touch base after your talk. Yeah, thank you very much, Maurizio, for um, the introduction. Um, I will talk about uh, statistical analysis and uh, data-driven model of type one and type two IP3 receptors. So um, we all know that uh, when an electrical or a chemical signal reaches a cell, it has to be translated to be propagated within the cell. So here you see the common schematic that everyone knows. Um, it is translated within the cell in a calcium signal. And in order to generate a calcium signal, we have seen this in previous talks, the calcium signal needs to be generated by calcium release from internal stores like the endoplasmic reticulum shown here. And the two most prominent channels are the IP3 receptor and um, the, the ryanodine receptor. I will mostly talk about the IP3 receptor today. Um, so the IP3 receptor here is shown just by one symbol. And um, this is a bit misleading because we know that there are, of course, many, many IP3 receptors. This is because we uh, consider just the flux through all IP3 receptors when we have a global model of a cell. This is appropriate if we look at global calcium patterns, but not if we look at a smaller spatial cell. There was also a different reason why I wanted to show this picture. And this is because um, it is from this great book edited by Maurizio and Hugues Berry, and it appeared uh, last year. So um, a nice book, have a look. So um, I want now to zoom in. So um, when we um, go from the whole cell uh, to more localized structures, we see that there are usually a few tens of IP3 receptors clustered together. And in these clusters, the IP3 receptors interact with each other. If one IP3 receptor releases calcium, this might activate a neighboring IP3 receptor. And um, the whole thing works like this again, um, the whole cell scale. So here we see how a signal is propagated from one cluster to the next cluster and activates this cluster as well. But I want to zoom in even more. So I want to look at a single IP3 receptor now. And I want to show you how we can find a model for the stochastic dynamics of a single IP3 receptor. The model will be based on one of the best data sets that are currently available. That's uh, the data from uh, Wagner and you patch clamp data from 2012. And uh, in this patch clamp data set, we have two different types of the IP3 receptor, type 1 and type 2, at two different IP3 concentrations, two ATP concentrations, combined with five to seven calcium concentrations each. And for all these combinations of different ligands, we have time series of about a few hundred thousand or millions of data points. So in total, you could say that this work is based on a few hundreds of millions of data points. So 
let's have a look how a patch clamp experiment looks like. So here we see data that you get from a patch clamp experiment. A catch clamp experiment takes a small electrode, points it close to an ion channel, and because ion channels, uh, sorry, because calcium ions are electrically charged, we can observe a small current when the channel is open and we see a zero current if the channel is closed. And when we observe these jumps here between zero and um, the small current, we see when the channel is open and closed at a very, very good time resolution. So now we will try to make a model for this, as you can see, really stochastic data. So the commonly used model for this is the continuous time Markov model. And I would like to explain Markov models in a bit more detail. So Markov models have one active state. So let's say that we start at C2 here. And from this active state, we can make stochastic transitions to adjacent states. And um, you can see here on the left um, which possibilities we have. Um, there are two adjacent states. We can either go to C1 and O3. So let's say we randomly move to um, C1. Um, it could also have been O3. And um, not only the state where we go next is random, but also the time this takes. But um, the rate constants Qij, so for example, Q21 here, say something about the speed of these transitions. So in the end, we get a random sequence between the states of the model. And for an ion channel model, we have multiple open and closed states. And um, the idea is very simple. When the model is in a closed state, we um, say that the channel is closed. If it's in an open state, we say that the channel is open. So um, we can um, not really predict where the um, channel will move next, but at least this model will uh, be able, will make us able to calculate the probability distribution over the states. So in this case, this would be P1, P2, or P3 over time. And um, the model is actually based on a system of linear differential equations, which looks like this. So we have a matrix Q, and um, the matrix Q has constant coefficients containing all the rate constants. And um, this model allows us to calculate over time the probability distribution of being in these states. Now, um, the problem is if this model really produces a different solution all the time, it seems really difficult to compare this with experimental data. Well, it is of actually um, perfectly possible to compare directly with experimental data, but I would like to show a simpler possibility today now. Um, so um, let's say we look at the time that the channel is open. And in the model, this would be regulated by the open state or by the parameter Q32 here. And we can, of course, also record this from the um, experiment data. We plot the times on a log scale and make a histogram. And we can calculate the open time distribution from the model and be compared with the experimental data. And we see here that the fit is very good. Now, we can also do this with the closed time. So here we move between the two closed states. We take the data from the uh, closed time distribution. And here we see something interesting because we actually have two peaks. And um, to make two peaks with our model, we actually need two closed states. And this is the reason why ion channel models usually have multiple open and closed states. Now, going back to the data, we see that there's a bit more going on than just closing and opening. So have a look at this. At 3.55 seconds, we suddenly um, become very active before we were mostly closed. And then at 3.57, 3.58, we switch back to a state we are, where we are mostly closed again. So um, I would like to spend some time analyzing this type of behavior. So um, when we want to find out where the open probability of an ion channel changes, then a possibility is to uh, simply look at the frequency of open and closed events that are observed. So um, I show an example here. Um, 
we have here uh, some open and closed um, events on the right of point uh, ji and um, the same thing on the left and um, we look at the frequencies on the left and on the right and if the frequency of open and closed events changes then we have a change from an open probability pi minus one to a different open probability pi now mathematically speaking this means that we assume that the O's and C's are generated by a Bernoulli process. So essentially, they are generated by coin tossing. So before a position Ji, O is generated with probability Pi minus 1. After the position Ji, O is generated with a probability Pi. We don't know what the probabilities Pi minus 1 are. We don't really know where the position Ji are, and we don't know how many changes we have. But nevertheless, by using this model, um, as we have shown in um, a publication shown here, we can analyze this behavior and actually find out for a given data set um, where these changes happen. So um, I uh, want to illustrate this again um, here with this uh, toy example. So essentially what we do is we count open and closed um, events. And then we see that the probability of seeing open and closed uh, jumps up. So here we have something that is close to zero shown on the scale here. Then we have something around 0 0.7 here, and then we jump back to zero. So what the ion channel seems to do is it seems to jump from a mode M1 where the activity is very low and the open probability is low to uh, mode M2 where the open probability is actually really high. And um, then it jumps back. So um, now we um, want to show um, how this looks like for a given data set. So here we have a complete data set from uh, the IP3 receptor. And we see blue, um, the inactive mode, and in brown, uh, the active mode. And we see that um, it switches quite a lot. But again, this time series is stochastic, so this is not easy to interpret. So we will use the same trick as before. We will look at the inactive and the active times to understand this a bit better. So um, let's look at, um, yeah, the IP3 receptor at different calcium concentrations. I would like to quickly browse through a few slides, and I would like you to look at um, how the peaks here change. So we have peaks here, 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 and here, this is the inactive mode, this is the active mode. So we start here and we will go through this once. So you saw that the peaks were moving. I would like to go through this um, a bit more slowly. So let's look at the inactive mode first. So here we have a peak at around, yeah, between 100 and 1000 uh, milliseconds and another one between 10 and 100. We see that the peak here is higher between 100 and 1000. And then when we move to a higher calcium concentration, the roles of these peaks seems to be reversed. Then they are about equal. And for even higher concentrations, the slow uh, inactive mode time is uh, getting more important again. And um, the same thing for the active mode. So for the active mode, what we see here is uh, actually even more interesting. We have here a single peak at around 10 milliseconds, but um, by increasing calcium, we can grow another peak here. And this peak then um, becomes more important as we increase calcium before it disappears again for really high calcium concentrations. So um, let me summarize what we have just seen for um, type 1 IP3 receptor. And I will also indi uh, indicate how we can represent this behavior in a Markov model. So for low calcium concentrations, we have two states representing the inactive mode. And um, then when we move to intermediate calcium concentrations, we get another state in the active mode. And that gives us a second peak in the active mode. So the channel becomes more active. And then when we move on to high calcium concentrations, we essentially go back to the situation of uh, low calcium. So um, now, um, how does the IP3 receptor seems to regulate its activity? I would like to show you um, 
something that friends and fans of the IP3 receptor actually know quite well. This is the famous bell-shaped open probability curve that goes back to Bas Prosvani, uh, Nature 1991. So here we show the version of this open probability curve uh, for the data by Wagner and you that was used um, for this study. So um, for low calcium, we have a low open probability. When we move on to intermediate calcium, the open probability gets um, larger and then um, it gets down again for um, yeah high calcium concentrations. So when we look at this in our model, we see that um, at low calcium concentrations, we have uh, two states representing the inactive mode. One is slow and one is fast and the slow one is more important and we have just one state in the active mode that is fast. So essentially the channel is mostly inactive. Now when we move to intermediate calcium concentrations, what we see is that we get an additional state um, in the active mode that is slow. So we spend more time in um, the active mode and also the faster state in the inactive mode becomes uh, more important. So um, it uh, essentially, that means that we spend more time in the active mode and have a higher open probability. And then again, when we move to high calcium concentrations, we go back to the situation that we had at low calcium concentrations. Now, I promised that I would say something about type 2 IP3 receptor as well. And um, I don't want to go into the same level of detail in the interest of time, but fortunately, the situation for the type 2 IP3 receptor is actually very similar, if not even a bit simpler. So for the IP3 receptor type 2, we have just a two-state model for low calcium concentrations. So we have a slow state in the inactive mode and a fast state in the active mode. When we move to intermediate calcium concentrations, we get another fast state in the inactive mode. And that means that we uh, have actually more short times that we spend in the inactive mode. And um, that um, makes us able to um, have more time in the active mode. And um, again, when we move to high calcium concentrations, we move back to the situation of low calcium concentrations. Now, I promised to give you a model for type 1 and type 2 IP3 receptors. And up to now, I have only talked about mode switching. And um, our model does not really open and close yet. So this is what I would like to talk about in the last part of my talk. I want to show how we can turn our results into complete models for the IP3 receptor. So let's go back to the data. So we have, um, for each data point, we know that the data is uh, that the channel is in the inactive or the active mode at the moment, but we also know that the channel is closed. And we know now how we can make a model for the mode switching. So this is a model that regulates the transitions between the inactive and the active mode. Now we can also look at segments um, representative of each mode, and we can make Markov models for these segments as well. So we have one here for the inactive mode and one for the active mode. Of course, there's a problem here now. We have not one model, but three. We have one for the switching, one for the inactive mode, one for the active mode. So the challenge is, can we combine these three models to one big model? And the answer is yes, we can. And um, I will show this on the next slide. So in the interest of time, I can't really go into full detail here. So um, if you're interested in the details, no problem. So I have published this a few years ago. Um, the paper is um, great if you really are into tensor products. There are tensor products all over the place. And I have to say that since that paper, I am a big fan of tensor products as well. But the underlying idea of this model is actually very simple. And I do believe that the tensor products can actually get lost can actually get a bit in the way of understanding what the model actually does, uh, because the idea is really very simple and could be hidden behind all the tensor products. So everything is essentially summarized in these slides. So um, as I said, on top, we have a model that uh, describes the switching between um, the two modes. And we have um, 
models for the individual modes here. So essentially what we need to do is we have to make sure that while we are in these states, we switch um, yeah, between copies of this model and while we are in this state, we run this model to make open and closed events. So this is illustrated here. So basically we just move one copy of the model here and another copy of the model here. This is what is shown here. And um, this is what happens, um, yeah, in um, the inactive mode. And then in the active mode, we simply slot in a copy of the model for the active mode. So let's um, look at this in full size again. So um, this is uh, mainly so that you can see the problem because we see here that we have transitions between these two states, M12 and M21. So what should we do with them? We know how we move between these two states, but these are not states anymore, but full models. So how should we move between these two uh, models, between the individual states of these two models? And even worse, when we are in this model, um, how do we jump from, say, this state to any of the three states here? And um, the answer is given on the next slide. Um, and um, this will hopefully illustrate why I like tensor products so much now. So it is relatively easy what we should do with um, the movements within a mode. So we simply say, OK, from an open state, uh, by changing the um, state within the mode, we should just move to another open state. So um, we just move to a state of the model to the same state in the corresponding copy of the model. So that is relatively easy. But when we are here, we actually don't really know where to go in the model for the active mode when we want to go there by the transition M23. So what we need to do is we need to randomly choose if we go to C1, C2, or O3. And we have to do this for both these states. And you see this is a real mess. And that's why I'm really thankful for tensor products because the tensor products allow me to work with these really simple models. And um, I don't ever have to consider um, these complicated models. I can just let everyone, everything be um, calculated by the tensor product. So let me now summarize what I have told you today. So IP3 receptors switch between an inactive mode M1 and an active mode M2. And I said something about how the activation of um, type 1 IP3 receptors worked. So a first state in the IP3 receptor is um, upregulated. And at the same time, we get an additional uh, slow state in the active mode. And that um, activates the IP3 receptor. So for the type 2 receptor, it's even a bit simpler. So initially, we just have uh, switching between a slow state in the inactive mode and a fast state in the active mode. And by getting another fast state in the inactive mode, we actually make um, the uh, model spend a bit more time in the active mode. So. Um, I have shown that switching between these modes can be taken as the construction principle of a model, the continuous time hierarchical Markov model that um, I um, developed for this purpose. But I think um, the benefit of this model is not only that it is an accurate representation of the dynamics, but what I like about this model as well is that it likely also um, in a way reflects the um, biophysics of the channel. So a channel is a three-dimensional protein structure and um, the protein um, opens and closes by uh, deforming this three-dimensional structure. So um, what I think um, the model illustrates is that the uh, channel makes transitions between um, different um, conformations. And I have illustrated this above this time series with this cartoon because I do like uh, doing yoga. I have illustrated this with a yoga instructor. So here we see a yoga instructor in the inactive mode. She is crouched so that she can hardly move. And um, this means that the ion channel will be mostly closed. So in the middle, she is in a much more flexible position and uh, she can open very easily. So this is when the channel is in the active mode. And um, on the right, she moves back 
uh, to the crouching position where she can hardly move. So um, this is everything for today. I would like to acknowledge many collaborators that have worked um, on this together with me. Um, I um, also would like to thank you for your attention and um, yeah, have a look on the right here. It seems that the IP3 receptor here has just blown you a calcium kiss. Very nice talk. Uh, thank you, Ivo. Um, I still have to recover from the calcium kiss, actually. So, but, I hope it was nice. Uh, uh, well, we figure it out if there is going to be another one later on. So um, I don't know. I mean, uh, channels are <laughs> stochastic. You never know when they will right, you again. Exactly. Plus, it's pandemic time, so we have. Yes. To get yeah. To yeah. It's only this. That, right. This. So it's a closed it's a closed state with a very low <laughs> transition rate. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, probably I, there won't be an, any more kisses. <laughs> so you can uh, just uh, close your share screen, and so I. Yeah, I will do that. I was just wondering if I uh, would have to share some slides, but yeah, I will. I will just. Come in back case you will if this is necessary. So with that in mind, I'll go on with the first uh, questions. So Alexia Isbraje is uh, is is asking. So a couple of questions. First of all, if there is support from molecular structure of IP3 receptors in uh, for the existence of M2 versus M1 modes, uh, like for example, yes. cryo or electromicroscopy or something. Yeah, so it's it's relatively recent. So um, when I um, thought about this a bit more, I actually looked at evidence from other channels. So there is a really nice uh, study by uh, Chakra Pani et al. in potassium channels. And what I did was exactly, I think, what Alexei suggests. So um, they um, took cryo-EM of uh, different muta mutated versions of the channel, and the different mutated versions did the different modes. So they could essentially prove that the channel looked differently when it was um, in different modes. So this is, in a way, a very brief and, answer. Uh, Okay, and um, he's also asking if, uh, so starting from the assumption that uh, more or less a couple of decades ago, uh, there was interest in non-Markovian fractal models for channel dynamics. Uh, would you be able to comment on, on, to comment on these uh, other models and how do they compare to nested uh, like mode versus like closed, open, closed modes in Markov models? So um, I have to admit that I didn't understand the. So uh, sorry, I, I okay non-Markovian so, and oh. right non-Markovian versus nested Markovian. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I, I didn't understand it um, uh, acoustically. I think so. Ah, um, sorry. I <laughs> I actually only know a bit about um, semi-Markov models, and uh, I think there the idea uh, mostly was that you could make um, the time. Uh, the sojourn time distributions a bit more um, flexible. So um, for the Markov models, you only get um, mixes of exponential distributions. But if you look at um, semi-Markov models, you can replace the um, sojourn time distributions and make the model more flexible. And um, yeah, I think um, I, I only know that these models exist. And um, I know that um, sticking together many um, exponential distributions is actually very good for approximating um, yeah more or less any continuous distribution so that's uh, why i didn't really look at this um, a lot more i don't really know about fractal models um, i have to admit sorry yeah thank you so then uh, audrey deniso from okinawa is uh, asking whether you have some simulations or you're planning to take uh, the simulations of single channel to whole cell level and in particular if you can say something on uh, what you expect uh, is the global or like the ensemble calcium signal that comes out from your receptor model with respect to other receptor models that have been introduced in the past such as the typical one the young and kaiser yeah 
I can say something about this. So this has mainly been done by Peng Jing, and um, he has used the previous version of my model. And um, I have to admit that my model, um, as it is, is not really suitable to make nice puffs. So you need to integrate even more data to make the model uh, produce uh, realistic puffs. So you need to look at um, data that um, describes the adjustment of the channel to new calcium concentrations. So that's uh, just one data set available by Mac et al. from 2007. Mm -hmm. Really difficult experiment. Um, and no one has ever done it again, I think. Um, so um, this is um, something that uh, Peng Jing has worked on a lot with um, my previous model, the Park Drive model. So you need okay. to extend the model by um, yet even more components to make it do that. But then, yeah, I mean, um, it um, can be used to produce uh, realistic puffs. I don't know then, if... Uh, um, okay, I, I'd like to move on with a couple of yes. questions. So maybe you can just uh, uh, deepen this aspect uh, directly in the chat with Audrey. On the yes. Ask some questions. So I, I, we have space for a couple of other more questions. I would like to just uh, uh, leave the function because it's inner phrase. And so move on with uh, some others. How uh, long do we do? Yes, uh, so quick question by Marsha Taheri. Uh, she's asking in general if you have an estimate of how long the channel stays in each of these open closed space or active versus inactive modes. Um, well, I mean, it's. Um, are you able like, characterize these in terms of analytics. Yeah, I mean, you, you can look at these uh, sojourn time distributions. So um, it's um, on the order of, um, yeah, um, say a 10 to 100 uh, milliseconds uh, if it's uh, long and um, shorter when it's uh, when it's short. So it's, it's still relatively fast. And uh, uh, one last question, and then you have a bunch of other questions, Ivo, that uh, you Yeah, I will, I will work on that. <laughs> answer. So Maria Saru uh, is uh, asking also if uh, more or less, or what is the estimation of how fast are the transitions between uh, the three models and how, like, a comparative uh, figures between the three models? Well, um it's in the end only transitions between um, the states of the full model. So um, the transitions between the inactive and um, the active mode remain the same as they were in the model that I uh, showed for the mode switching. So essentially nothing new happens when I combine the three models. They are just calculated from the three models. No new parameters are introduced. So. Um, it's just the same time scale. The time scale doesn't really change. Okay. So with that in mind, uh, Ivo, I, I, uh, I can please direct you to just answer the question. Yes, thank uh, you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for a nice talk. And uh, I am going to ask uh, uh, Ben Shin to join me on stage. There is Ben Shin. For those of you that who are kicking in or joining in right now, we are uh, we have been uh, delayed of half an hour. So this is the last talk of the second session of the second day of the Calcium Workshop. Uh, we had some technical issues before. So this is the talk by Tang Shin Tao from the University of Melbourne. And before we go on, I would like just to, to give you a short introduction on who is uh, Tang Shin. So Peng Shen got uh, his training originally in math at the Shanxi uh, Normal University in China, uh, which is in the region known as Xi'an, which was the old uh, capital of China, empire. And then, uh, I hope not because of the food, because it's fairly good down there, he embarked in a journey on the Antipodes, and where we rejoin actually uh, James Knight and Graham Donat, Donovan at the University of Auckland, uh, New Zealand, uh, where he started studying uh, modeling of IP3 receptors and calcium oscillations in airways moves muscle cells. So for those of you that uh, suffer of asthma, probably Tang Shin could be also the guy. 
So I, I don't know, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> and since uh, then, uh, he's uh, been a researcher, so he took his PhD on 2014, and since then he has been a researcher. I'd say first young and now arguably probably a senior at the University of Melbourne, um, uh, developing a multidisciplinary agenda uh, that revolves around uh, uh, basically stochastic analysis and applied probabilities with emphasis uh, and applications on biological systems, in particular cellular signaling and on the other side uh, infectious disease spreading, so influenza, malaria, tuberculosis and so on. So today Peng Sheng is going to give us a talk on his work on uh, calcium signaling and stochastic uh, characterization of the inner and sources of noise of this signaling and uh, without further hesitation I, I'll, uh, I'll ask him to share the slides and uh, leave the stage. Thank you everyone joining this uh, very last talk. Uh, I will definitely finish quicker. Um, so I'm not going to talk about some some uh, work I, I previously did during my PhD about modeling an uh, inner situ phosph phosphate receptor, which is IPS3 receptor, and mediated calcium oscillations, in particular in the airway smooth muscle cells. Um, yeah, so it's both unfortunate that uh, we can't mm, meet in Melbourne, and I'm in Melbourne cold winter night. And okay, so today I'm going to talk about um, two things. One is the project I uh, was working on, it's modeling the IPS37 media calcium oscillation in the aerosmooth muscle cells. And uh, uh, pretty much the very last slides will post some, uh, some of my thoughts about this uh, problem uh, still uh, un uh, unresolved and uh, also about some questions uh, about uh, extension of these uh, uh, calcium oscillations uh, possibly in other cell types. So the first thing is so, um, in every smooth muscle, muscle cells, uh, what the oscillation, calcium oscillation looks like is something like this, very uh, uh, similar uh, to what we see in many other cells. You, you can see the periodic oscillations. Uh, I mean, periodic is, uh, essentially stochastic, as uh, Martin uh, explained. Uh, and uh, this is a measure from mouse aerosmooth muscle cells by, uh, by the application of methacholine, which is organist bound to the cell receptor and trigger uh, the IPS3 receptor, uh, IPS3 uh, released uh, to the cytos cytoplasm and bound to the IPS3 receptor, which I will show um, the, the schematic diagram later. Um, I reckon you all know this mm, basic, uh, this schematic diagram about calcium dynamics. And uh, um, so men, like 10, 20 years, years ago, people uh, only apply the very high concentration of the organism. So they only see very fast oscillations. So you can't really see any um, uh, interspike intervals as, uh, as Martin mentioned. Uh, in his talk, and so people believe this this is a, like purely deterministic oscillations, and um, but but then uh, we we actually questioned uh, questioned the, uh, this and uh, this phenomenon after you know after reading uh, Martin's work, and we think that might be stochastic event if you use very low concentration of methacholine. And we urge them basically to to do some experiments for us, um, which we actually got something really uh, interesting, and uh, luckily we got this one. And you can see that the the spikes are actually uh, appearing in a very stochastic way, where interspike interval uh, are basically stochastic. And we also did similar analysis uh, um, proposed by Martin. Martin and, uh, and his colleagues that calculate the, the slope of the interspike interval uh, mean and standard deviation and basically the, and calculate the coefficient, uh, coefficient variation uh, 
And then we do find this uh, stochastic, this is a truly stochastic event, although there's some kind of a refractory uh, process involving in determining this, um, the spark generation process. So in summary, uh, about the data, we can see this uh, oscillation depending on methylcholine concentration, which is essentially IP3 concentration, as we already know uh, by a number of papers published many years ago. And uh, we know this is a stochastic event for low methylcholine concentration. And uh, also we can see this is a very fast oscillation. A uh, fast oscillation, oscillation, I mean, is uh, the the oscillation has a very short period of time for each event. Uh, in mice, it lasts about uh, two seconds or one to two seconds, and in humans, it's a bit longer. Okay, the, this is basically the mechanism I introduced um, previously, and similar to uh, the mechanism that other introduced in other talks. And so, so the key thing is um, when the organ is bound to the uh, G, G protein coupled receptors. And that will produce IP3 that diffuse um, in the cytoplasm and bound to the IP3 receptor and then open it. And then there's a huge amount of calcium fl uh, flow outside the, uh, through the IP3 receptor to the cytoplasm. And uh, that will further trigger the um, calcium induced calcium release uh, on both IP3 receptor and the renal receptor that caused. Uh, like a single, like a big calcium release event. And eventually there's some mechanism, uh, we believe that is due to the inhibitory effect, uh, inhibitory state of the IP3 receptor, such that the spike can terminate. Also there's a buffers and calcium uh, uh, exchange um, between the cell membranes. And also there's a mitochondria, um, but uh, I'm not going to introduce that in the model. So the basic question is uh, um, for us is how we can reproduce the stochastic calcium oscillations in aerosomous muscle cells based on what we know about the machinery. And the second thing is pretty much about the, the, the EVOS model and the pack drive IP3 set model, which I will introduce later that when I um, join James group, James Smith's group. And uh, so this model only developed a, uh, uh, for for one uh, probably one year, uh, not yet, but not yet, not published yet. But the model is already there. So my 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 job is, it was uh, to to test whether this model is working uh, to generate the calcium oscillation in a closed cell model because they've done some experiment that if you if you uh, turn on turn off the the calcium channel the, the channels in the uh, calcium channel in the in the cell membrane the cell can still oscillate uh, the calcium can still oscillate in cell so it does not really depend on the calcium exchange uh, across a cell membrane and also the final uh, quest question is so uh, that stochasticity of the calcium oscillation matters for frequency encoding like a, like a um, other cells uh, for the real event, the stochastic event might drive some um, expected uh, uh, thing that deterministic model cannot actually capture. So we want to test uh, how well deterministic model and stochastic model match each other. Uh, so before I'm modeling the calcium oscillation in the in the erythromous muscle cells, uh, we we actually had a had a, a conversation with Martin. Uh, many years ago, and uh, when I started my PhD, and uh, uh, we found because uh, he suggests that there, there's a path that's that that looks like this uh, on the left hand side of the, the panel. There's paths in in the neuroblastoma cells, and uh, uh, and you can see the path has a, a very short duration. It's uh, without buffer, EGT buffer is probably last about a second, and with EGT buffer, uh, it lasts shorter because of the, that's the, the buffer effect. And uh, this is actually inspire us to to think about or oh, maybe the calcium oscillations or uh, at least calcium spikes in the in the erythromous muscle cells is actually induced by puffs. And uh, and another information is we, we, we did not find any paths in the every muscle cells. Uh, 
So it's likely that those calcium global kind of global calcium oscillations actually uh, kind of local calcium paths. And uh, we, we do see calcium propagate along the cell. So you can see this, uh, the, the right hand side the figure is a smooth muscle cell, which is a very long tube uh, shape uh, with a very thin uh, diameter, uh, about uh, maybe less than 10 micrometers. So which is pretty much the size where it does not allow too many uh, IP3 receptor or renal receptors there to actually induce uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, calcium release. So it's more likely to be the number in terms of size of the cell. It might only contains tens of the IP3 receptors that generate, that, that is kind of suitable for generator path. Uh, so we move on to modern calcium paths, and, uh, and this is another information that by varying the um, basically the flash duration on the left hand side is like the flash duration, like flash duration of the K, uh, the the photo release of the cage IP3. So that you can read it as uh, the IP3 concentrations increasing as the duration increases. So you can see the mean path frequency increases when the IP3 increases. And on the right-hand side, the methylcholine concentration also corresponds to roughly the IP3 concentration in the cell. So it's also increasing. So that also um, uh, gives some ideas that there might be some similarity. So we, we, we model calcium paths by uh, introducing a very simple uh, uh, structure of uh, calcium uh, models like a DCDTC is a calcium concentration in the cytoplasm uh, and particularly near the IP3 receptor uh, uh, site and uh, it's driven by a number of fluxes uh, and also we introduce a buffer which will be used to calculate the fluorescence ratio that will match the, the data. So this is basically uh, based on some of the fluxes um, as James introduced we sometimes we borrow some of the fluxes rather than uh, select all possible uh, fluxes, fluxes to model a particular uh, event. So, um, so this is a leakage, this is a decrease which might be circa pumped and might be diffusion to the other side. So based on a simple model, um, uh, we, need to, we, need to, well, we need to introduce uh, an IP3 receptor model, which is exactly the, the, the EVOS model. The, uh, the pack drive mode, uh, pack mode and drive mode is actually the most, uh, most uh, like a model gating properties that Evo introduced. And the channel can be in the pack mode and in the pack mode it can uh, fast, fastly tra transit between uh, different states and it can, can switch back to the pack mode which is a bit more quiet like uh, um, the the figure show in, uh, in the left, um, Left bo bottom left uh, left corner, and uh, I'm not going to introduce the detail of the model construction, which should be done by Evo. But the one thing I would like to mention uh, is that this model do uh, does not include the property that shown on the um, bottom right corner uh, about the sudden change of calcium concentration or sudden change of IP3 concentration. Then how the how the channel react uh, to such a change. So uh, on the left is just a stationary, we keep calcium concentration fixed and uh, or IP3 concentration fixed and we, 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 we measure how the channel, uh, we measure the channel activity. So by incorporating the both type of data in the model, uh, so we actually uh, uh, can, can, able, can, can simulate this uh, calcium paths. So the, on the left hand side is the, the calcium paths published um, in the uh, uh, by, by uh, in Smith and in Parker in PNS ten years ago, and what we really want to do is try to reproduce that. And this is a reproduction um, by the model, and uh, we actually have some variables to indicate what the inhibitory effect or what the refractory phase are. So. And that give a bit more details of underlying mechanism driving this uh, path uh, kinetics. Um, okay, so um, 
And then I move on to uh, model the calcium oscillations in every smooth muscle cell. And the calcium oscillation is basically calcium puffs, uh, we believe. And the model takes a similar form, but a slightly different because there's a whole cell model, uh, deterministic, and it can be stochastic, uh, which is uh, determined by uh, how you model this uh, one of the fluxes uh, called the JIPR, which is a flux, the calcium flux through the IP3 receptor. So if this one is dependent on the stochastic opening and closing of the IP3 receptor, then it's a stochastic model. If it's uh, 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 con like continuous uh, open and release probability, open probability model, then that will be a deterministic model. So we have some ways to, to, to approximate stochastic model using uh, deterministic model, although not precise. Uh, and that that's uh, something uh, we 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 have done. And uh, another an uh, and the rest of the uh, uh, the fluxes are deterministic, including uh, the some variables in the uh, in the in the IP3 receptor, which is the very bottom two equations. So this already simplified from the six state unpack and dry model. Um, dry, dry model. And another difference from a traditional. Uh, uh, calcium model is uh, the introduction of the 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 local calcium near the IP3 receptor, which is the variable CB subscription B. So this variable is not very common because previously we proposed a single uh, calcium concentration in the cytoplasm by C without CB. And uh, Michael Sanderson, who who was a very um, uh, uh, Big expert in, in the field of iron smooth muscle cell, and but is is deceased now, unfortunately. And he he said, "Oh, I don't believe that there will be too many circuit pumps around these uh, IP3 receptor channels." So that's that's slightly different from uh, uh, from calcium puffs, where the the calcium re like a remove of calcium from the puff side is actually induced by either circuit pump or or rapid diffusion of calcium to other side, like the whole space, uh, and then going back to the uh, ER by by circa. Uh, but here, uh, you know, just model the whole wholesale. Uh, so we have to introduce some calcium which is not immediately going back to circa, uh, going back to the the SR through through the circa. So we have to allow the diffusion of the calcium from the site of the path or the site of the IP3 receptors cluster and to the to, uh, to the other side of the, the cytoplasm and then pump it back to to the to the SR. And what we uh, we got is a kind of stochastic simulation on the bottom, the right hand side, and uh, which is quite well matched the data. And the, the, on the right hand side is statistics showing that, <coughs> sorry, um, the model um, can actually capture some key um, features that, like the IP3 dependency, and also whether the peak of, peak calcium uh, concentration, uh, how how peak calcium concentration vary uh, according to the IP3 concentration. We can we do not see much change, but of course the interspike interval. Or the, or the frequency of the oscillation change dramatically when you change IP3 concentration or metacoline concentration. And, uh, um, and for the spike duration, it is relatively robust to, 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 the, to the change of IP3. And finally, we, we examine uh, whether the like a deterministic model and stochastic model uh, match, how, how well they match uh, each, each other in terms of the uh, changing the model parameters, uh, so we can see that. Uh, although uh, I did not really test uh, uh, very a broader region uh, of the parameters, uh, but at least in uh, quite large a larger uh, range of the parameters, so we can see the, those two models are qualitatively similar in terms of predicting how uh, the frequency changes uh, as uh, in response to uh, parameter change. Okay, so that's pretty much the end of the talk. And uh, uh, finals, uh, I, I can read some questions. Like uh, we believe the sh uh, like short duration calcium oscillations because the sh the, the short 
refraction period of the IP3 IP3 um, uh, receptor, which is uh, actually named the local lo local negative feedback by Martin, and not really a global one. But we have no idea whether we really need a global one or there there might be uh, some global ones we haven't haven't introduced that. Uh, and we do have do, do see some longer period of the oscillations in the cell. For example, in human, there's a longer period of oscillation. So the question is, are, are, are those IP3 receptors different between human and mice? Or it is, is actually the same IP3 uh, channel, like the IP3 receptor have the same properties, but they actually uh, perform in different uh, by different functions. So we have no idea that. Uh, and uh, the very last one is the customer oscillations. The other cells uh, uh, include both local and global. And uh, basically, this is a question I will ask, ask Martin that how, how do the two uh, can work together to generate robust oscillation? I think Martin is pretty much developed a theory uh, about this, but we, 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 we did some simulation, but we, we got some problem with the simulation that we can't really introduce a proper global feedback to generate a, a well, uh, like a observe, observed cosmic oscillations, like global cosmic oscillations um, in, in a wholesale model. And, and, and we have no idea what the global feedback should be. So that's kind of probably a good question for Martin, if Martin is there. And thank you uh, for, for listening. Thank you, Bangshim. Uh, very nice talk very interesting system okay so while there are some people that are posting questions i will ask you uh one question at least so <clears throat> so my understanding uh of, of of the system which i absolutely not familiar with is uh, that uh, the same machinery that actually we find in neurons and in glia meaning the ip3 receptors uh, that uh, in this case you model by the park uh, uh, model. So is underpinning the stochasticity of, of the signal, right? Yeah. So do you confirm on that? Perfect. So the question is now, um, how robust is the functionality of the signals, uh, of these cells with respect to the inherent uh, noise that they bear in their signal? I mean, these cells, uh, as I mentioned before, are pretty crucial in uh, in your well-being right like if this signal becomes uh, somehow perturbed they release the cytokines and uh, we get asthma we, we potentially even life-threatening conditions in our respiratory tract so how would you um, envisage the functionality of these cells if uh, what, what is controlling the different stochastic activity of these cells at the level of uh, of the entire muscle or the, the muscle track. Um, I think this is really a question uh, for Martin uh, in terms of general general reality of this uh, kind of uh, robustness that the calcium oscillations. But in, in every smooth muscle cells, we 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 do uh, find that the, the oscillation frequency determines the the, the rate of contraction of the area smooth muscle cells. So if you have a very fast oscillations and coupled with the elevated calcium concentration, so, you, so it's not just the, the calcium oscillation itself, but you need a, like a, a elevated elevated baseline calcium such that the area smooth muscle can contract. And su such that if you only apply very uh, weak stimuli, uh, such that the, the calcium oscillation will be very random, very with, um, stop, very random and uh, maybe very short or very um, uh, like a, uh, uncontrollable, then there won't be uh, any effect on the every smooth muscle cells. So, because uh, only when the custom oscillation frequency increases to a certain kind of certain level, uh, and the custom baseline can be elevated, such that the cell can contract and can see the signal and contract. 
So I think this is how the cell uh, controls the by the calcium signals. Uh, yeah. So actually, Martin is is, is answering. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not. And uh, and because uh, I have a lot of questions about global and local feedback. Yeah. Uh, a little, so one more question, uh, if uh, so, and the, the others, uh, I mean, down here in Europe, it's lunchtime. So, okay, yeah, yeah, we can, we should so, finish that. So yeah. it's a little bit, um, I mean, at least in Spain, but we don't really are a good yeah. measure. Is it, is it, is it, it's half past yeah. yeah, it's okay. But, uh, uh, and, and thank you for, like, I guess down there, it's a little bit late. So um, another question instead on the, on the, uh, Disposition, so like the spatial arrangement of the components of this uh, of this calcium signal within the cells. Do we know anything like about potential clustering or specific locations of the IPG receptor, the sources, the calcium uh, endoplasmic reticulum or sarco endoplasmic reticulum in this case? So, um, no, no, we haven't. How, how do they look like? How do these cells look like? They are pretty flat. So the cell looks really like a long, uh, fuzz, like fuzz form shape, like a long tube, very long, like a hundred or two hundred micrometers long, but a very thin. The diameter is about uh, less than ten, as it sh as I shown this before. That is and less so, than ten micrometers, so it's very and so, thin and long. So and. So it is, uh, the signal that you record is actually what the average of the entire. Cell. No, no, no. The signal is just a, a like a region interested. So very tiny region in some part of the cell. So you just pick that and focus on that, and then you measure calcium signals in the region. Because any signals, if it's strong enough, then that will induce the calcium waves traveling through the whole cell. I see, but. Can you have different sources at different location of the cell of the calcium signal? Can they be independent? No. I, I, I have no idea, basically. So uh, I don't know. Okay. But there's no. Uh, uh, it seems that the, because the, the wave can you know can travel through the whole whole cell, it seems that it's kind of uniformly distributed because it does not stop anywhere. We can we we can't see the calcium. So, so it's it like that, spanning yeah, through. yeah, kind of. Uh, very very nice custom waves through the whole whole cell, but from one end to the other. Or if you if you uh, stimulate in the middle, then there'll be a traveling waves to both sides. Yeah. To both sides. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank okay. you. Thank uh, you. I guess so we don't have any further questions. With that, uh, I, I I close your video and I close also this session. And thank you everyone that has been listening to the second session of day two of calcium uh, signaling workshop at the CNS 2020. And we are going to come back live in 30 minutes from now with the last uh, and I guess longest session of this workshop. So we'll have about six uh, speakers. Uh, so uh, time to uh, rest a little bit, refresh, uh, and be ready for another amazing um, uh, list and, uh, and uh, four hours of splendid talks and uh, fantastic speakers and very engaging discussions. Uh, so that, uh, greetings, this is Maurice Lipita from uh, the Bus Center for Applied Mathematics here in Bilbao, and I'll see you in 30 minutes.